whole pitcher of water going on you gentlemen. Good afternoon and welcome to our second uh, public witness hearing covering non-tribal uh, programs under the jurisdiction of the Interior Environment and other related agencies uh, subcommittee. This morning we heard from advocates from the arts and from the humanities and discussed issues related to land and water conservation funding, energy, science, and conservation programs. This afternoon we're going to be focusing on issues related to endangered species conservation, public lands, and critical environmental programs for our nation. We'll be hearing from the remaining 21 witnesses. Before I begin, I'm going to go over a couple of logistics here for the hearing. We're trying to stay on time so my colleagues are in and out of the room. We have a gentle person's uh, agreement to, to help each other. Um, but we also have, as you see in front of me, a big fat book with everybody's testimony. And Jocelyn can tell you I have a lot of things highlighted so I've looked at things before and I'm frantically taking notes during the hearing. Um, so I want you to know that, uh, that you are being listened to and paid attention to. Um, what we're going to do, uh, and the first panel's at the table, we're going to call the panels up um, one at a time. Everybody's going to get five minutes to present their testimony. We're going to use a timer to track the progress. When the light turns yellow, the color of this highlighter, <laughs> witnesses will have one minute remaining to conclude their remarks. When the light blinks red, I will lightly tap. I won't use the big end of the gavel. But I'll let you know um, that uh, it's time for the next witness to start. And that's so all witnesses can have an opportunity to be heard uh, without uh, getting too delayed. Having said that, we do have both scheduled <clears throat> sometime between 1.20 and 1.30, we feel. So when we call votes, please uh, make sure that we're going to be taking a brief recess and come back as soon as we can. And we'll pick up where we left off. So I'd ask people to stay close. There are places to get coffee and some things around here on this floor. So um, take your rest break and grab what you need, but stay close because we'll start as soon as a member is back. I'd like to remind those in the hearing room of the committee rules, however. We prohibit the use of cameras and audio equipment during the hearing by individuals without House-issued press credentials. So uh, Mr. Joyce has told me to get started so we don't uh, delay. And uh, what we did this morning to save a little extra time is we had people introduce themselves. And we, uh, we found it really kept things moving a little faster. So we, maybe the second panel would like to get in before votes get started. Mm -hmm. So Mr. O'Neill, your introduction will not count against your time. So please introduce yourself and then we'll start your time. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Uh, much appreciated. My name is David O'Neill. I represent the National Audubon Society and our 1.7 million members across the country as its chief conservation officer and senior advisor to the CEO. And you can start your testimony. Sure. Um, I'm here uh, to discuss an ongoing crisis of bird survival, what the crisis signals for communities, and steps the committee can take to reverse the alarming trend. Since 1970, we've lost three billion of America's birds, and two-thirds of our remaining birds are now at risk of extinction due to climate change. The birds we've lost are not just threatened and endangered species, but common birds in communities and backyards across the country. The bird declines we're seeing and predicting are due to human activity, loss of habitat, greenhouse gas emissions, on and on. This is the fifth alarm in a five alarm fire that is crystal clear to the 48 million birders across the country. But birders aren't the only ones who should care about these staggering figures. Birds are important indicator spe species. They are indeed the canary in the coal mine, meaning they, that severe declines in bird health tell us about future threats facing people and communities. With the administration implementing rollbacks to bedrock environmental laws, increasing federal conservation investments is a critical backstop. The bipartisan projects and programs under the, your jurisdiction provide tangible, scientifically based solutions to recover our bird populations as well as to provide cleaner air and cleaner water. The National Audubon Society is proposing fiscal year 21 funding priorities to address critical threats facing birds and to start to reverse these declines. I thank this committee 
for its work to consistently expand and enhance conservation funding. The recovery of birds uh, require it. Our recent State of the Bird study that documented the three billion bird loss also found one area for hope, waterfowl. Waterfowl are the one bird guild that not only experienced, uh, did not experience declines, in fact, it increased by 56%, in large part due to investments to wetlands conservation work through the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, or NACA. And I thank the committee for continuing to prioritize this investment. Conservation works, and we urge funding for this program at $50 million. The Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act Grants Program is one of the best opportunities to build on NACA's success for the billions of migratory birds that pass through our backyards to breed and winter outside our borders. The program is innovative, cost-effective approach to bird conservation, supporting projects that benefit birds and their habitats, research and monitoring, law enforcement, and education programs in Canada, the U.S., Latin America, and the Caribbean. It's important to reauthorize the act and to fully fund the program at $6.5 million. And we'd like to work with you and others to see how we could expand that program in the future. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative provides a regional success story that not only restores habitat, but allows the community to take part in education and stewardship of restoration programs over a long period of time. The newest GLRI action plan prioritizes, among other things, the restoration of wetlands that attract and restore sustaining, uh, to sustain breeding marsh bird populations. Increasing the investment in GLRI can help advance these important goals for birds. Investments at the ecosystem scale, like the Great Lakes Program, are critical to protecting the full spectrum of habitat needs for birds. We urge the creation of a similar program for the Mississippi or Upper Mississippi River Basin, and we'd be thrilled with the opportunity to work with you, Representative McCollum, on that to make that a reality. These are, they are, um, there are dozens of successful programs moving forward across the country, all of which require full and sustained federal funding. We're standing at a crossroads. Now's the time to fully invest in conservation programs at scale necessary to, to address the crisis and to ensure a sustainable path forward for birds and communities now and into the future. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thanks very much for this opportunity to testify. I'm Steve Holmer, Vice President of Policy for American Bird Conservancy, and we work to conserve birds and their habitats throughout the Americas. Um, we're going to be talking today about a package of funding requests from a large coalition of groups, and uh, this includes um, the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act at 6.5 million, Migratory Bird Joint Ventures at 19.9 million, uh, State and Tribal Wildlife Grants at 70 million, North American Wetlands Conservation Act at 50 million, um, State of the Birds activities at 5 million, and then an, an overall $10 million increase for invasive species eradication, monitoring, con con control. And we appreciate um, language about the greater sage grouse and the need to advance its conservation. And I just want to take a moment to thank the committee because there were some very significant increases in last year's bill for this package of programs. Um, this committee recommended over $20 million in increases, the final bill. Um, included about $10 million. So this was an important step in the right direction. But based on what we know about the three billion bird report and the state of the birds, there needs to be quite a lot more done. And I'm not sure if you've received a copy of the uh, 2019 state of the birds report, but I just thought I would share that with you and, uh, and others on the committee if you'd like to, to see this, because it does highlight the, the science study showing the 2.9 billion birds gone. But it also shows that through state wildlife grants and through the migratory bird joint ventures, we're also seeing a lot of successes. We're seeing things getting done on the ground that can really make a difference. Um, in your region where we have the um, Mississippi, Upper Mississippi and Great Lakes joint venture, the Kirtland's warbler is being delisted through concerted conservation action. And so it, it shows that when we focus the, our efforts, we can bring these birds back. Um, of course, wetland conservation is another big success story where we've managed to bring back waterfowl in large part through NACA. Um, the, the joint venture in your region has guided a number of NACA projects in Minnesota, and, and one of the reasons we are interested in supporting this package is for the simple reason that all these programs work very closely together. So I feel like we're making good progress and, and appreciate the support of the committee on, on these issues. 
in light of the Billion Birds report, there is an indication, though, that we need to think about doing even more. This is kind of a beginning, is, is kind of how we're, we're seeing that. And we also need to maintain the regulatory framework that makes sure that endangered species and public lands are protected. And at this point, with rulemakings happening on the National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, on sage grouse plans, on Forest Service NEPA, we're concerned that the safety net for wildlife and public lands is now at risk. And so we appreciate the, the committee weighing in against these changes. Um, I don't believe the public supports these, these deregulatory efforts. And it's really unfortunate that at a time when we're in a crisis where we're seeing you know, significant losses that there are policies that could end up actually making the, the situation worse. So, um, so it's really important that we address it on both the funding side and on the policy side. This committee included some uh, really strong language in the report last year about reducing bird collisions. We thought that was very, um, very helpful because about a billion birds a year are lost to, to bird collisions. There was also language about the Tongass National Forest, actually an amendment to uh, protect that forest. And forest carbon is very important as, a, as part of the strategy to address climate change. And we would love to see that language be included again in this year's appropriations bill and perhaps be expanded to include the Pacific Northwest where we have old growth forests that have very high carbon stores that are also essential for threatened species such as the marbled murrelet. And in fact, the, the um, relationship between murrelet habitat and high carbon forests is nearly 100%. So by conserving that bird, we're helping on climate change as well as clean water for the region. So I appreciate all the, the good work of the committee and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon, Ms. McCollum, Mr. Kilmer. My name is Dan Ash. I'm the president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the uh, former director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, it's a pleasure to be back in front of you and a, and a privilege, a privilege uh, because of the importance of the work that you do to wildlife conservation, a pleasure because I neither have to present nor defend an agency budget today. Um, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, is the world's leading zoological professional association. In order to be a member of a facility like Como Park Zoo and Conservancy or Northwest Trek, uh, must meet our exacting accreditation standards, the world's gold standard for a modern aquarium or zoo. And our vision for a modern aquarium or zoo is of a purposeful place. Yes. Uh, fun and educational where visitors uh, come and create memories that last lifetimes, but most importantly, a place, places where a visit helps to conserve wildlife and save animals from extinction. Our 238 member facilities spent a collective $231 million on field conservation in 2018, uh, positioning them as among the world's biggest conservation investors. And that number will likely approach one quarter billion dollars in 2019, and it will continue growing. It's not a phase or a fad, it's who they are. And we're passionate partners of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, and their state, local, and tribal counterparts. We support their work to conserve and recover species like California condor, manatee, black-footed ferret, sea turtles, hellbender, American burying beetle, red wolf, rhinoceros, and dozens and dozens more. Your support for the Endangered Species Recovery Challenge grants is inspiring this partnership, and I hope you'll expand funding for this program and insert report language encour encouraging the service to grow its partnership with accredited zoos and aquariums. Our members are ready and willing. We're building exciting new partnerships with the Interior Department agencies, and I'll just quickly mention three. Uh, since 2017, we've built a zoo park partnership, and this past year signed a memorandum of understanding with the Park Service uh, calling for 25 new partnerships over the next five years. The Yosemite National Park San Francisco Zoo Partnership is a perfect example. They just released their 1,000th endangered California red-legged frog in an effort covering four valley floor habitats where introduced bullfrogs had eaten up, literally, the native populations. Park and zoo staff collect frogs and tadpoles, which are then reared at the zoo until they're ready for reintroduction around age two. Uh, through efforts like this, we're helping national parks and national wildlife refuges 
uh, conserved species like sea turtles, corals, grizzly bear, and bison, and linking AZA's 200 million annual guests with their national parks and other public lands, um, and, and connecting urban America with wildlife and the outdoors. Again, with the encouragement of report language and a few dollars perhaps for National Park Service natural resource management and, and refuge operations in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we will grow momentum and excitement about this partnership. AZA's signature conservation program is Saving Animals from Extinction or SAFE, and it's driving cooperative conservation of species from elephants to sharks to monarchs. Wildlife trafficking is a major cause of decline in many safe species, and through AZA's Wildlife Trafficking Alliance, we're working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on an innovative pilot confiscations network to help rescue and care for animals that are victimized by illegal trade. And finally, we're developing a strategy to manage AZA's entire polar bear population to support relevant conservation science and this is going to help the service and others answer key questions about the effects of climate change, uh, manage wild bears, and also engage millions and millions of visitors. So Ms. McCollum, subcommittee members, AZA's members are already exceptional partners of the Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, and others. They're anxious to do more nationally and internationally to conserve wildlife and save animals from extinction, your encouragement through funding and report language will inspire ever more cooperation and innovation. And I want to thank you for your time and attention and everything that you do, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, put this in, in a general format, and then uh, those of you who feel comfortable uh, speak to it. So. We, we worked very hard to get writers, authorizers need to do their job uh, out, of, out of our bill. We were very successful. We still have a little ways to go. Um, report language is a way in which we try to monitor what's the cost of inaction or what, what, what can be the benefit of action, um, getting that from the agencies and outside, outside groups. So <clears throat> the report language that we put in is, very, uh, is a useful tool for us when we're making um, our decisions, as well as it's a useful tool for um, the authorizers when we're, we're having conversations on, on things. So, um, for example, uh, lead poisoning has been brought up. What's the cost of lead poisoning? What's the cost of having a writer like that in there? What, what, how much money are we spending? What other things are we doing? What's the cost of inactivity when we don't get ahead of an invasive species? You know, you know Dutch Elm took place, People probably weren't talking too much about birds back then. Climate change wasn't the issue it was then. But since then, we've seen, you know, what's happened with uh, the, the, um, the beetle uh, that's attacking our pine, with what's going on with Asian ash borer, urban and rural areas, and in forestry areas, and then the effects of climate change on top of that. So there's a cost, whether it's forest health or bird population, of not doing anything. What's the cost of when we see um, insecticides and, and things like that, you know, keeping it in or out of the water, how's it affecting um, uh, frog populations? What happens to the bird population that eats the frog? So we're trying to get a holistic approach and try to take a scientific approach to things like doing that. So I appreciate the acknowledgement of the, the report language we're putting in there because inactivity has consequences on our budget and activity can have positive, sometimes negative uh, consequences on our budget. So if I could just um, maybe ask you to kind of um, uh, speak to invasive species because we're trying to uh, do more with that in the committee um, about how our organizations can work with the scientific community. If, you, if you've got some ideas of how Mr. Joyce and I, Mr. Kilmer's here, he cares a lot about the, the birds. I was in his district. He's got beautiful, you've got seabirds. I don't have that. So you've got it all. <laughs> so could maybe just take a, take a minute or two uh, a, a, a piece and just kind of tell me, you know, our, if there's some ideas on how we can get the invasive species part of this right, ideas on that. Sure, I'll be happy to jump in there. 
Um, sage grouse are in severe decline across the range, and cheat grass, an invasive grass, is a, a major factor. And in fact, I've had Forest Service agency people tell me that if we don't deal with the cheat grass problem, there's really no way to bring back enough sagebrush habitat to, to conserve the grass. So there, there's one example where we could do more on cheat grass. In Hawaii, uh, mosquitoes and the spread of avian malaria and other diseases are a huge problem. These are non-native insects in Hawaii, and now there's efforts to eliminate these mosquitoes in Hawaii, and this is really crucial because we're seeing a lot of birds go extinct in Hawaii because of, of the avian malaria and, and other diseases. So, so there's two examples where um, you know, in dealing with invasives is, is really critical. And then the last is the, the monitoring, the fast attack. You know, we think about the brown tree snake, for example, if that were to get to Hawaii, it would be disastrous. So there needs to be this ongoing effort to monitor and keep, keep things out, and then when they are in, attack them immediately. Um, two things, Ms. McCollum. I, I can't uh, resist the temptation to speak about California condor and lead poisoning. And so the key in that case is to, is to stop the source of lead poisoning. Every California condor that is in the wild in California is, 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 has to be taken back into captivity and, and put through lead chelation. And if that didn't happen, and it's AZA's members like Los Angeles Zoo and San Diego Zoo and Santa Barbara Zoo that are doing that work, um, and if that didn't happen, then that, that recovery of that population would collapse automatically. So we have to eliminate the source of the problems and have the courage to do that, and non-toxic alternatives are available. With invasives, you have to <coughs> act quickly. And so um, right now, we're helping deal with a coral reef crisis off of Florida. The, there's an there's a, um, in, invasive disease that is wiping out um, 25 of the 40 coral species along the entire Florida reef tract, over 300 miles of coral reef. America's largest coral reef is being decimated uh, by an invasive, unknown as yet, disease. Um, and so what's required is to get in ahead of that, rescue the coral, pull them into refugia so that we can have the hope of restoring that reef once we find out what's going on. And so the key thing for the federal agencies and their state counterparts is to act quickly in the, in the face of a species invasion. So Mr. O'Neill, birds eat fish, fish live in coral, we'll let you close it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think one of the things that we're finding, particularly on our seabird work, which is interesting maybe to Mr. Kilmer, is that you're starting to see a mix of species moving into areas where seabirds really rely on fish in order to survive. They're out on the water maybe 70, 80 percent of their life cycle. They're getting fish now that are too large for their beaks to be able to feed. They're no longer productive. And that's a big shift because of climate change. The warming of some of these oceans are creating different movements of fish. As a result, the seabirds aren't able to eat fish that are um, the size that can create productivity um, when they move to, to their breeding grounds. So that's, a, that's an important shift. But the importance of the, the actions that can be taken are around really thinking about managing the small forage fish that are in these river systems and, and that move out into the oceans. Protecting forage fish is really important to saving seabirds, and seabirds have declined some 70% over the last 40 years. So that's an invasive species that's moving as a result, in part, of ocean temperatures and warming. And I, and I just I want to pick up on Dan's point about you know, something along the lines of the pesticide issue for birds. And uh, Steve and I were talking about this earlier. It's a major issue for our board and our members. but pesticides we are more and more concerned about in terms of their impact on birds and um, that's an issue that we want to uh, explore further. And I think some scientific research relative to the impact of pesticides on birds and the health of birds would be very valuable to really draw that link, that scientific link between pesticide use and the loss of bird species throughout the Americas. Thank you. Right. Mr. Joyce. Have you found any birds that like to prey on the Asian carp? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Got a bountiful <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Mr. Kilmer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And if the second panel would come up, please. I've noticed our clock is working here, but it means we'll check when you go to vote. But we can register it here, but it's not okay. going from yellow to red. So is, is it not going to yellow at all? No, it's going to yellow here, but not on the monitor. Huh. Okay. 
Sometimes you can reset stuff. Sometimes you can't. So, um, I think we're going to be fine. We're finding out that we're seeing a yellow light. This morning we saw a yellow light, but you're not seeing a yellow light right now. So we'll give you an indication kind of where, where the minute comes without being too disruptive. So if, um, as the first panel did, if you'd introduce yourself, and then we'll start the clock then. Good afternoon. I'm Jacob Malcolm. I'm the director of the Center for Conservation Innovation at Defenders of Wildlife. Defenders has 1.8 million members and supporters, uh, and we are dedicated to the conservation of wild animals and their habitats in their natural communities. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak with you today. The science that has been marshaled in recent years shows with unrivaled clarity that this is a pivotal time for wildlife and for humanity. You're likely familiar with last year's report, the Global Assessment on the Status of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, found that one in eight species on the planet, or about a million species, are at risk of extinction. That's tens to hundreds of times faster than the background rate of extinction, and ultimately we're the cause of this loss. We've altered over 75% of terrestrial environments and two-thirds of marine environments. When you combine that loss with ongoing threats like invasive species, climate change, the damage that we've done to nature is almost unimaginable. And the consequences of that are not just borne by nature, but also by humanity. Half a trillion dollars of crops are at risk of loss because of pollinator loss, which is a really big deal. Ecosystem services from fisheries to water filtration and beyond are all at grave risk of loss because of the damage to natural systems. But despite the darkness of these results, we also have good reason for hope because we know that we have solutions. We know we can make a difference when we act. We have reduced the risk of extinction for plants and animals by some 20 to almost 30 percent by investing in conservation. In the U.S., this is because of laws going back over a century for conservation, starting with the Lacey Act in 1900 and because of our stewardship of our federal public lands and, public and private lands across the country. Defenders has a number of priorities that we've laid out in our written testimony, but here I wanted to focus for a moment on the key law for addressing the extinction crisis that we're facing now, the Endangered Species Act. The ESA is the, the epitome of success. Over 95% of listed species are still with us today, and hundreds of those are on the path to recovery. This record of success is even more stunning when you consider that species have received less than 25% of what scientists say is needed to recover them. You can imagine what we would be able to do if we invested fully in the Endangered Species Act. <coughs> this point may have been most clearly made last fall in the journal Science when 1,800 scientists endorsed greater ESA funding as a key strategy for re responding to the extinction crisis. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the lead agency for recovering most listed species, but its endangered species budget needs nearly double the current funding, or about $486 million a year, for the agency to carry out the mission as Congress intended. For example, the backlogged listing program needs to increase nearly threefold to $51 million a year so that the agency can determine if species need protection. The recovery program funding needs to nearly double to almost $197 million a year. That would allow the service to complete almost 400, actually over 400 recovery plans that are needed and thousands of recovery actions that are already planned and just need to be taken action on. The consultation planning program needs an almost 50% increase to $130 million, which would allow, among other things, the application of new technologies that really massively increase the efficiency of consultations. And the Cooperative Endangered Species 
Conservation Fund, which empowers states and uh, private landowners to take conservation action, needs at least $100 million a year. Across these programs and others detailed in our written testimony, we have laid out a path to address the extinction crisis that looms before us. You and your constituents depend on nature and the ecosystem services it provides. Fundamentally, laws like the ESA will be little more than lip service to wildlife if they're not funded fully and carried out. So thank you for the funding increases last year. Defenders and all of the wildlife and their habitats certainly appreciate it. Now we need <coughs> leaders to use their authorities, the power of the purse, to further our commitment to halt the extinction crisis and reverse the fortunes of nature. Thank you so very thank much. You. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Bear with me. I have a very scratchy Why voice. Why don't we make so. sure you have a glass of water <laughs> handy in case you need it? <laughs> Thank you. That's kind. Um, I won't wait on that, though. My name is Kate Wall. I'm here on behalf of the International Fund for Animal Welfare. I am the senior legislative manager in our United States office. The International Fund for Animal Welfare, thank you, or IFA has offices in 15 countries around the world and works in more than 40 countries globally. And we want to thank the chairwoman and ranking member Joyce and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify here today. IFA is very grateful for the subcommittee's championship and of strong conservation funding in the current fiscal year. And as a member of the International Conservation Caucus, uh, we also thank both the chair and ranking member for your le conservation leadership, both on this committee and elsewhere. So I'm going to deviate a little bit from my prepared remarks today because Chairwoman McCollum, you asked about the cost of doing nothing during the last panel. And I wanted to start these remarks by saying that the Intergovernmental Platform on Climate Change put forward a report last year that said that the total value of global, global ecosystem services is roughly equivalent to global GDP. That's huge. So the cost of doing nothing to protect our ecosystem services may be as much as allowing global GDP to trickle down the drain. All right, I just wanted to seed that in your minds before I get started on my more formal remarks because I think that sometimes when we talk about <laughs> wildlife and ecosystems, we think about these as something that we need to think about in the future, not something that we should worry about today, something we need to worry about our bottom lines of today. We all do this, I do this in my own thinking uh, when I'm, I'm thinking about my budget at home. But the reality is that we may be squandering huge resources that we do not have the wherewithal to put back into our coffers if we don't act today to protect wildlife and protect ecosystems here in the United States and globally. So we have heard, just by turning on the news, about some really pretty serious and grim challenges that face us around the world. We hear about sea level rise, we hear about warming oceans, we hear about biodiversity loss. If you aren't scared, then you aren't paying attention. But I don't want to focus on our fear today because fear can paralyze us. And the reality is that those of you sitting across the table from us here today have the power as leaders in this country to really make some transformative changes and make a better world for us. And I want to inspire you to act in that way. So put the fear aside and let's talk about some things that you can do with the power of your purse. We continue as the United States to be a global leader and the actions that we take here at home matter on the global stage. Some of the things that we can do internationally include funding the International Affairs Program within the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is tasked with coordinating domestic and international efforts to conserve species and restore wildlife and wild lands. These are programs that look not just at iconic species, which we'll talk about next, but species that we may not have heard of, transboundary species, ecosystems, and they really have a power to create change 
in wide swaths of the world with very, very little. And we ask, they also, because of language that you justifiably put in the FY20 appropriations report language, are tasked with ensuring the highest level of integrity and professionalism among partner organizations. And so we ask for further funding to ensure that they have the resources that they need to carry out, out those very important uh, offices. With regard to iconic species like those protected by the multinational species conservation funds, species like tigers, rhinos, African and Asian elephants, great apes, marine and freshwater turtles and tortoises, these species continue to face threats from poaching, from trafficking, and from climate change. And while there was a significant increase in funding in the last fiscal year, for which, again, we are very grateful, these threats have not gone away, and we need more preventative funds now so that we don't risk further cure funding required later that will be much more costly to taxpayers and species writ large. And finally, on the international stage, the Office of Law Enforcement within Fish and Wildlife Service is tasked with a huge amount of inspection of wildlife and wildlife products that come across our borders. They have attaches around the world. And as we face yet another global pandemic, which it appears to have been caused by wildlife interactions, we see those as all the more important offices that need to be carried out with additional funding. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you here today. Hi, my name is Tim Schaefer. I'm the <coughs> director of the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And like uh, Minnesota and Ohio, we're both a Great Lakes state and a Mississippi River watershed state. People often think about the fact that the Ohio starts right there in Pittsburgh. Um, and I'm here today on behalf of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. I'm the current chair of the Legislative and Federal Budget Committee for the association. Oh, should I start again? We're good. OK, good. Well, thank you. Generally, the association supports no less than FY20 funding levels for the various budget line items under your purview. However, increasing funding for the Division of Fish and Aquatic Conservation of the Fish and Wildlife Service is important to ensure sufficient capacity and expertise is readily available to work in partnership with the states on various projects and issues. At least maintaining FY2020 funding levels for the national fish hatchery operations, functions, and budget line items is critical and we request the same for mass marking initiatives. Additional funding to address the National Fish Hatchery System's deferred maintenance is also necessary to continue species restoration and conservation efforts. We support the National Fish Habitat Action Plan at $7.2 million and can continue FY20, FY20 funding levels for conservation activities in the Delaware River Basin, Klamath Basin, Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, and the Everglades. The spread and associated costs of aquatic invasive species are exploding. We've been talking about that already today. And we recommend increasing funding for AIS prevention in the FAC. This should be part of a comprehensive approach across relevant federal agencies and the programs that provide resources to states to prevent and control AIS. We request Congress to restore funding for state aquatic nuisance species management plan implement implementation to $4.4 million without compromising other ANS programs. And we support the continuation of a $25 million annual appropriation to implement the National Asian Carp Management and Control Plan in the Mississippi River and its tributaries. Really emphasize if we get it right in the tributaries, that helps to prevent the spread to the Great Lakes. The state and tribal wildlife grants program is the only federal program available to states to leverage non-federal funds to conserve over 12,000 state species of greatest conservation need to prevent them be from becoming threatened or endangered through voluntary, proactive, and state-led conservation efforts. It's a lot cheaper to keep something off the endangered species. You like to say, we want to keep common species common. The association recommends the program be funded at $90 million in FY2021. To truly address these challenges, we ask Congress to enact the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, H.R. 3742, which prov would provide states and their conservation partners with dependable resources and a modern enhancement in how we finance the full array of diverse fish and wildlife conservation for current and future generations. 
the Fish and Wildlife Service and states share management jurisdiction for migratory birds. This represents one of the most successful state-federal cooperative partnerships for over 80 years. Unfortunately, the Migratory Bird Conservation Program is chronically underfunded. More funding is needed to retain sufficient staff, fill key vacancies to, vacancies to work in cooperation with the states on co-management issues, and support science to inform decision making. The association supports funding the program at FY2010 levels and the Migratory Joint Bird Ventures at $19.9 million to accomplish shared responsibilities and priorities. Thank you for providing much needed funding for the USGS Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit program in FY20, and we strongly support maintaining the funding in FY21. Further, we support additional funding for the science centers. In Pennsylvania, we recently learned that the Northern Appalachian Research Lab in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, may close this year because of de decreased funding. That, that lab provides critical data, research, and information to our agency on how we man manage freshwater mussels for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, but we manage all fish, reptiles, and amphibians in the Commonwealth. They've also supplied really critical research and data to us on the filtration roles of mussels, um, how they're connected to eels, and how that would help with Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts. The cleaner the water is leaving the Susquehanna River, the better it is for the bay, and mussels play a role in that. We get a lot of great data on that from that USGS facility in Wellsboro. We also support additional funding uh, for the National Fish or National Wildlife Health Center to deal with chronic wasting disease. Uh, we support no less than FY20 funding levels for other budget budget line items within USGS ecosystems. However, it is imperative that Congress provide additional resources to all relevant federal agencies to coordinate with the states on challenges related to CWD. We respectfully request that the subcommittee refer to the association's testimony on CWD provided on October 17th, 2019 for additional CWD related needs. Thank you for upholding the commitments to end wild, wildfire borrow, borrowing. We support the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service budgets at no less than 20 levels, FY20 levels, and respectfully request an additional $3 million for this program. So at that point, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I didn't know if that buzz was for me or not, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Appreciate all of you being here today and, and your input and look forward to working with you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you all for your testimony. Um, Mr. Malcolm, I wanted to thank you in your written testimony for uh, calling out the important role played by the regional climate centers um, in supporting efforts to combat climate change and to adapt to the impacts of climate change. Um, I'm really grateful to our chair and to this uh, committee for protecting and growing funding for the eight regional climate centers, um, including the Northwest Climate Center uh, at the University of Washington. I was hoping you could just, in the brief time we have, just uh, could you al elaborate a little bit on how the science that's produced at these centers um, informs our efforts to respond to the threat of climate change? The um, We are, so, sorry, give me just one second. Yes, the, the science uh, is critical to being able to make informed decisions. W we are at a day and an age where we understand how to do this. Uh, as some people have noted, the, scientists, the, the science is so advanced and our understanding is so advanced. Um, we know how we can make use of it and bring that information to the lawmakers to be able to make decisions. Um, I wish I had a very specific example, for example, from the Northwest Client, uh, Climate okay. Center that I could give to you, but I don't. Uh, there is this very tight, or there should be this very tight relationship between science and policy that society follows, and climate centers are essential for carrying that out and helping folks in different regions across the country understand the consequences. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, 
the um, fact that uh, when I read through your testimony, you see how everything's interconnected, all three of you did, and the support and the reasons why supporting something in fish and wildlife is important to something, um, you know, with migratory birds, with, with whatever, because um, quite often I know somebody can say, oh, I'll cut this, and they don't realize what the impact it's going to be on achieving the goal that they really want to achieve. So um, I just wanted to compliment uh, your testimony because you're kind of doing the broad, the, the, the broad cloth uh, how all the pieces fit together to make the quilt happen. So thank you for kind of putting that together w for us, for the committee to take a look at that. And with that, um, we'll be in recess until the call of the chair after votes. Thank you.
This landmark study, in combination with the other writings, The Edge of the Sea and Silent Spring, led Rachel Carson to become an advocate on behalf of this nation's vast coastal habitat and wildlife that depends on it. Her legacy lives on today at the refuge that bears her name and is dedicated to the permanent protection of the salt marshes and estuaries of southern Maine coast. The refuge was established in 1966 to preserve migratory bird habitat, waterfowl, migration along southern Maine's coastal estuaries. There's 11 refuge divisions in 12 municipalities protecting approximately 56 hundred acres within 14,800 acre acquisition zone. I've been on the board of the Friends Group since 1989. The organization was founded in 1987. We're a small group with a history of communicating with our main congressional members, who are missing our representative right now, Shelley, uh, for decades. In the past, we sent letters via U.S. mail, then anthrax forced us to fax our letters. Then the electronic age made things very simple, email and PDFs. The Friends play an important role in supporting the Rich Carson National Wildlife Refuge mission. We work to educate Maine's U.S. congressional and state legislation about the relevance of the refuge wildlife habitat, its coastal resilience, tourism benefits, and the use for future generations. We support refuge staff by volunteering with trail maintenance, greenhouse activities, administrative work and visitor services. We engage the towns and communities that surround the refuge through mailings, meetings, events, and a future co conservation theme book group. We fundraise and apply for grants so that we can assist with hiring refuge interns, purchase equipment, and support res research projects. We support acquisition funding and refuge operation and engage in environmental education and outreach programs. National wildlife refuges protect habitat for a host of wildlife species while also offering storm surge protection, improving water quality, supporting nurseries for commercially important fish and shellfish, providing recreation opportunities for local refuge communities. Each one of you have a national wildlife refuge in your home state and maybe even one close to your home. I request, number one, an overall FY21 funding level for of $586 million for the operations and maintenance budget of the National Wildlife Refuge System managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. All the refugees are in dire need of staffing and upkeep. Without increased funding for refugees, wildlife conservation and public recreation opportunities will be jeopardized. Every dollar appropriated for the refuge system returns an average of 4.87 to local economies. Number two, I request to appropriate $283 million for the wildlife and habitat management projects within the ONM budget. These monies will support restoration of salt marshes, removal and control of invasive species, recovery and rare species, continued fire management programs, restoring cultivated land to its original habitat, implementing climate change strategies of adaptation, mitigation and engagement. Number three, I request $41 million for refuge land acquisition projects. In addition, the Land and Water Conservation Fund needs to be permanently funded at the 900 amount annually. I've been advocating this for over two decades to Congress, and we finally have L LWCF permanently authorized, but now to have the amount permanently funded at 900. As you know, there's H.R. 3195, the Land and Water Conservation Fund for Permanent Funding Act, is pending and we all need your continued support. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and we thank Rachel Carson for inspiring us all. I leave you with a quote from Rachel's book, A Sense of Wonder. A child's world, world is fresh and new and beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. Each of the national wildlife refugees have a unique story and history behind the name, but they basically all serve one purpose, protect wildlife habitat. With that wonder and excitement, I thank you again for the opportunity to present my testimony in support of our National Wildlife Refuges. Thank you. Ms. Duckbell Lambert. Mr. Hall. Good afternoon, Representative Kilmer, uh, Ranking Member Joyce. It's on. The, the light's on. Oh, I just need to be louder. I can do that. Um, my name is Justin Hall. I'm the current president of the Friends of the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex, and I appreciate the invitation to testify today on behalf of the Friends. So our Friends group was formed in 1999 to promote the conservation of the natural and cultural resources of the refuge complex and engage in educational, charitable, scientific, and civic activities that will increase public awareness and assist management in accomplishing refuge goals. 
We provide just under $60,000 a year to support programs at the refuge, with our primary focus being the environmental education program. The Nisqually Complex is blessed with three very unique places. Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1974. The creation was led by a grassroots citizens movement to aid in the protection and enhancement of the Nisqually River Delta. In 2009, the refuge accomplished the largest estuary restoration on the West Coast when 600, 762 acres of dike habitat was converted back to salt marsh and tidal estuary with central rearing grounds for the threatened Puget Sound Chinook salmon. Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually is an urban refuge located between the cities of Olympia and Tacoma just an hour and a half from Seattle and two hours from Portland, the refuge receives over 220,000 visitors a year and over 10,000 students and teachers participate in the environmental education program. The Black River Unit of Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually protects a unique freshwater floodplain that is also critical habitat for the federally threatened Oregon spotted frog. The Black River Unit is not open to the public at this time because of lack of funds to develop and staff it for visitors. Grays Harbor National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1988. The highlight of Grays Harbor is one, the 100,000 shorebirds that stop over during the spring migration. The refuge is open to the public where visitors can view large flocks on the one mile boardwalk extending into the salt marsh. Over 12,000 people visit annually, mostly in the spring. Partnership between Grays Harbor National Wildlife Refuge, Grays Harbor Audubon Society, and the city of Hoquiam puts on the Grays Harbor Shorebird and Nature Festival during the peak spring migration the last weekend of April or the first weekend of May. The three day festival brings in more than 1,400 visitors. The Grays Harbor Hoquiam Aberdeen area is economically depressed, and one of the purposes of the annual festival is to increase ecotourism and help the local communities. However, an annual festival only provides short term benefit. Grays Harbor has the potential to be a mainstay in the community and a destination for visitors if an interpretive center, prioritized by Congress but not funded, was supported for construction with an annual budget for staffing, operations, and maintenance. The biggest challenge at the Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge Complex is adequate funding for staff. Currently, seven permanent employees manage over 11,000 acres of land, with the Black River Unit 40 minutes from main office and Grays Harbor Refuge an hour and a half away. The complex has one maintenance worker to maintain the infrastructure and assist with habitat management, yet a large amount of the time is spent commuting between these work sites. Ideally, the complex needs 15 staff members to achieve the full purpose of the refuges, not only to benefit fish and wildlife, but also provide quality, safe outdoor opportunities for the public. This is a common limitation for many other refuges. Law enforcement is also a significant issue for our complex. Currently, we have one quarter of a refuge law enforcement officer for all three of our locations. The officer is housed two hours away in Squim at the Washington Maritime National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually is located directly off of Interstate 5, the major corridor between Seattle and Portland. This close proximity and easy exit and entrance onto the highway may be the reason why there is higher crime at Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually, particularly car prowls. Trespassing into closed areas set aside for wildlife and engaging in non-wildlife dependent activities are also big problems despite miles of trails throughout the refuge. For example, portrait photographers disturbing birds so their subjects can sit in the grasslands dog walking in the refuge, and fishing and hunting in closed areas. A full-time law enforcement presence on the refuges is needed to curb abuses and to provide education to those unaware of the rules and regulations and the reasons why they are in place. Additionally, a security surveillance system to the parking lot would go a long way towards reducing the problem with car prowls. The education program at the Billy Frank Jr. in Squally is incredible and is the direction for the future focus of this urban refuge. The refuge is a popular regional destination, especially on clear Pacific Northwest days, and regularly exceeds its visitation capacity due to current resource limitations. This is also true for the education program. It serves a remarkable 10,000 students each year, but is facing growing demand from school districts and staff and teachers. With additional staff, the program can be expanded to provide environmental education outreach within the communities and then follow-up visits to the refuge. We want to help create the next generation of people who actively take care of our nation's lands. As it is now, our friends group and volunteers are picking up the slack and smoothing out the inconsistencies in the funding to the best of our ability. However, volunteers and outside staff are not a sustainable model for our refuge system. We support the request that the subcommittee allocate $586 million in funding for the refuge system operations and maintenance fund for fiscal year 2021. This increase would greatly impact our refuge and the Squally National Wildlife Refuge Complex would be better able to hire the staff needed to have an adequate level of law enforcement, increase our urban, out urban refuge outreach, control invasive species to benefit a diversity of fish and wildlife, restore critical habitat for Oregon spotted frogs, construct and operate the promised interpretive center at Grace Harbor National Wildlife Refuge, provide additional wildlife dependent opportunities at Grace Harbor National Wildlife Refuge and the Black River Unit, and further build out our environmental education program. Our refuges are the face of public lands for many people in the South Puget Sound community, as they are for communities across the country. We need adequate funding to ensure that they stay protected, accessible, and stewarded for the generations to come. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Is it Brower? Brower, yes. Oh, Ms. Brower. Thank you so much. 
My, good afternoon, my name is Carolyn Brower and I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the National Wildlife Refuge Association. I very much appreciate the invitation to testify today on behalf of the National Wildlife Refuge Association and our members and supporters, particularly the Friends groups who do such amazing work on the ground, joined today by Justin and Bill and we're thrilled to have you into town. The Refuge Association was started 45 years ago by retired refuge staff who wanted to start a group to advocate on behalf of the National Wildlife Refuge System. Today, the refuge system consists of 568 refuge units across 850 million acres, which is roughly the size of India. Refuges are on all 50 states and in five marine national monuments in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Today, I want to talk to you today about what the refuge system has been able to do with the recent increases. There was an increase of $14 million in the budget this past year in 2020. With the $2.9 million increase included in the budget for law enforcement, the refuge system has hired 43 new federal wildlife officers. Last year when I testified, I stated that 13 states have zero or one officer. With these recent hires, this is no longer the case, and we are anticipating law enforcement staffing to increase, especially in the states that have been particularly neglected recently. Another place that will receive more officers is border refuges. For several years, the Fish and Wildlife Service has moved nearly all of their, refuge, their officers on a rotating schedule down to the border for 21 day details. With these new hires, we expect those, uh, these detailees to be continue, discontinued, which will allow these officers to stay at their home refuge. With additional funding in the upcoming appropriations bill, the refuge system is planning on hiring an, an additional 12 officers, which will raise levels of staffing and law enforcement to a new recent high. Current law enforcement funding is $41 million and our goal is $70 million. Another positive outcome in the FY20 bill was additional funding on invasive species. The Fish and Wildlife Service is facing serious impacts on nearly every wildlife refuge with 2.4 million acres infested with invasive plants. I'm sure all of you will recognize names like Phragmites, Kudzu, and Salt Cedar. There are also 1,749 invasive animal populations, which includes everything from mice and rats on the Pacific Atolls and Islands to feral hogs, quagga mussels, pythons, and Asian carp. To show the impact of funding eradication efforts, one great example is nutria in the Chesapeake Bay. Nutria are a rat species that are roughly 14 pounds on average, which is larger than my cat. There are, they are extremely destructive to wetland habitats. For several years, there has been a substantial amount of money put towards eradicating nutria in the Chesapeake Bay. There's been a lot of people, they have a team of dogs, lots of money and focus. This is about the fifth year with no nutria sightings, so perhaps this next year, nutria will be considered eradicated in that area. There's also been a new effort to create an invasive species strike teams. There was $2.5 million for this in the FY20 bill, which is enough for five new teams, bringing the number up to 12. Their goals are early detection and rapid response. One species that is a prime target for the strike teams are mice on Midway Atoll, these mice are literally eating the albatross alive as they sit in their nests, and it is a gruesome sight. And I'm told that at dusk, you can see the ground moving. There are so many mice there. I want to thank you for your support of funding for the refuge system and for that overall $14 million increase in the 2020 bill. The system needs another boost of funding this next year. Funding is now $1 million lower than the height of funding in 2010. And FY10 funding of $503 million after calculating for inflation would be $598 million now. This means that the refuge system has had to absorb $94 million in cuts over the last 10 years. As a result, the system has lost one seventh of its staff. Acres needing prescribed burns are left untouched. Half of refuge units are unstaffed. Law enforcement funding, even with recent increases, is at about 25% of full staffing. Many, many refuges have no visitor services staff, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you see the refuges that do have these staffers and you realize the value they add to the community in terms of bringing school kids out to refuges and teaching the community about nature in their own backyard. Anyone who's been to the Prairie Wetland Learning Center in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, knows the value of hands-on nature for kids. This is what visitor services staff does. Just imagine if we could replicate centers like that all over the country. Refuges are currently funded at 59 cents an acre. Parks in comparison, and I agree we're talking about apples and oranges, but parks are funded at $30 an acre. Our goal for over a decade now has been to get refuge funding up to $900 million, which would still be barely a dollar per acre. 
We are asking your subcommittee to include $586 million in the FY2021 appropriations bill. Thank you very much, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Mr. Landbaugh. Sure. Yeah. Great. We love pictures. Thank you. I'll pass them along. Uh, good afternoon, um, uh, ranking ranking uh, member Joyce and Mr. Kilmer and anyone else who's listening in the room. Um, it's a lovely afternoon if you're a duck. Um, I am the executive director of the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm super grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today. The purpose of this testimony is to introduce the Interior and Environment Subcommittee to a replicable nonprofit model for urban revitalization. The Urban Ecology Center, the UEC, uses environmental education as a tool to transform challenged urban parks and neighborhoods, and our work is capturing the attention of cities across the country. The UEC started as an experimental social invention based on research that states, if one has consistent access to nature from an early age, while having a mentor in your life who demonstrates respectful behavior toward the land, that person is very likely to grow up caring for and working for the environment. That is the kind of person we need right now in the world. Our mission then is quite simple, to connect people who live in cities to nature and each other. The center began in the mid-90s as a small group of teachers in a humble trailer in a high crime park in one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in our state. We started offering field trips to nearby schools and quickly discovered that what we were offering was needed. Nature-based recreation and education is beneficial in every major way, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, and physical. Our trailer became a hive of community activity for adults and kids. Our success allowed us to grow, and we now are in three beautiful green-built and rehab buildings that bustle with community activities on Milwaukee's south, west, and east side. While the center began as a strategy to improve ecological literacy of folks in a city, we discovered that when a, when a UEC is placed in an urban park, so much more happens. The park becomes safe. Student academic achievement improves. New jobs are created. Volunteerism explodes. And if done correctly, a significant influx of community resources flow into the park and nearby surroundings. The center has catalyzed over 45 million in direct investments in and near the parks that we occupy. What once was blighted, even dangerous green space becomes a safe anchoring community asset. Last year, we hosted over 220,000 visits by youth and adults at our three branches in Milwaukee. 3,500 volunteers helped us plant over 10,000 native trees and plants in the 70 plus acres that we now manage. We partner with 63 urban schools providing 35,000 students with regular field trips. We reach an incredibly diverse audience. All ages, racial, political, and economic back backgrounds come together at our centers. Both sides of the aisle have supported us. Today, cities all over the nation are reaching out and showing interest in replicating this model. To help facilitate, we published this book, Urban Ecology, and created a training institute around it. To date, we've had over 50 people come through our training representing 19 different cities, Columbus, Atlanta, Rochester, and Den Denver, to name a few. We've had cities from different countries as well. 20 years after our inception, the program is flourishing to such a degree that it was suggested that it was important for you, who are charged with governance of this nation, to be aware of our existence and the transferable impacts we are having. I am deeply honored that you accepted our testimony to speak to you today and have hopes that you and any listening might be able to assist us in finding additional partnerships and funding opportunities to help accelerate the spread of our important program. Worth noting, we have worked with the U.S. Forest Service in creating a 40-acre children's forest and arboretum out of remediated industrial land. And we are also grateful to receive nearly a million dollars of funding from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, the first year of its inception, 
to help remediate a tier one tributary into Lake Michigan. Thank you. Congratulations, by the way, on passing the reauthorization bill for the GLRI just yesterday, I believe, right? Well done. Uh, some of you uh, may be in Milwaukee this July for the Democratic National Convention. Come visit. We'd love to show you around. And if you happen to know of anybody looking for a unique venue for their meeting or event, please contact us. We have really cool facilities, these uh, ultra green facilities. Um, I know, as you, uh, Ranking Member Joyce, that the freshwater bodies in our region aren't merely good lakes, they're great lakes. Ac accordingly, I don't know if I'm allowed, but I've brought you each a Petoskey stone, a polished, fossilized, ancient stone found only on Lake Michigan as a gift from the lake. Uh, I actually have enough that folks in the room can have them as well. And there's no real value to these except for the beauty. So I think it's okay for me to give them. It's not like a People bribe frequently anything. throw rocks at us, so <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. We're good. So we're good. Thank you. Thank you. These, these are quite beautiful. So take one. Pass it along. Make sure you get one. You're doing the hard work. I'd like Tyler to get one because he, he helped me out early. And then anybody else in the room until they're gone. <coughs> um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have about our mission and our work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. This got Oprah real quick. You get a rock, and you get a <laughs> rock. <laughs> um, Mr. Joyce, do you have any questions? No, I want to thank you all for being here, and I appreciate all the hard work you do, and, and uh, hopefully we can all continue to work together for a better planet. I'd like to thank each of you for your testimony. I've been trying to get David Joyce to come to the Democratic Convention for a long time now, so <laughs> thank you. <for laughs> I got to Washington. That was yeah, there you go. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. Um, I actually did want to just make a maybe a comment and a question to Justin. Um, thank you for mentioning uh, some extraordinary refuges in our neck of the woods. The Billy Frank Jr. Uh, refuge is um, really incredible and um, is um, – uh, appropriately named after someone who was a real champion for tribal justice and for environmental justice. And I know that the work of that refuge is designed to um, sort of live up to that mission. I'm also really grateful that you mentioned Grays Harbor and uh, the Shorebird Festival. I would encourage anyone who's watching on C-SPAN 8 um, <laughs> uh, to come visit Grays Harbor County. And it really is an extraordinary refuge, the Shorebird Festival. So I got to bring my... Um, I've got two daughters. Um, when my young, my oldest daughter was quite young, she was a total birder. Um, she, she was very unusual. Most kids would read Dr. Seuss, and she would read like a book on birds. And at night, rather than reading Dr. Seuss, she'd be like, "The yellow-breasted war warbler, you know, lives in shrubs and trees and uh, migrates in the fall." Right? It was a very unusual childhood for her. But I took her to the Shorebird Festival, and it was so cool to see her just sort of connect uh, with nature. And the only connection I'd seen prior to that was um, Angry Birds. It was about as close as she got to connecting. Um, and so I appreciate you mentioning that. I want to ask you, in light of these unique assets, so if there was additional base funding Talk about how that could build capacity for connecting with communities, connecting with youth. You mentioned a couple of examples, but I just want to make sure we, we hear the message loud and clear from you. You bet. So the it, most of the education comes out of the Billy Frank Jr. in Nisqually, and we actually um, have a partnership between the Friends Group, the Refuge, uh, some amount of their base funding, and uh, another nonprofit, the Nisqually River Foundation, that provides a staff member in order to do that. And then we have a couple of AmeriCorps one that works Grays Harbor and one that works at Billy Frank Jr. Um, it, you know, as I said, we reach capacity. We, our parking lots are full. People are parking on the grass everywhere else on those occasional sunny days that we do get in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so the, the way to increase the outreach and the benefit of that refuge is to get those education staff out into the schools, into the community. Um, we also work with the Nisqually Tribe with their Head Start program, um, getting them out. And then they don't they, they learn about the refuge and what the missions are and what we're trying to do, and then they have that capstone field trip uh, into the refuge itself. And so it really, uh, working with Joint Base lewis McCord, um, and then uh, Pierce County Schools and uh, Thurston County Schools and some Lewis County Schools, we're really able to extend that out, and then those people come back, uh, the students come back with their parents, and you know they learn 
um, what the refuge system is for, why they're there, what the benefits are. And so really, that, that is that next step. And uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service had an urban refuge uh, contest, uh, a funding contest, uh, which added a million dollars to the base funding, um, which we applied for. We still have that plan ready to go. We were not successful. Um, they only did one, I think did two. It, we went on for three years. They did uh, two refuges one year and then one refuge the other two years. And uh, Willamette down in our district was fortunate enough to get that. But we have those plans ready to go. And so really to extend the impact of the refuge uh, into the community, it just requires that extra base funding in order to fully support that education program. Terrific. I appreciate you mentioning that, and uh, I, I also just wanted to call out the, the staff at both of those refuges are just really tremendous. Um, yeah, absolutely amazing people to work with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Can I, have, can, can I offer a thought to his, his Go comment? Go on. Dive in. Um, I was just thinking, I, I'm curious, uh, in our model in an, of an urban ecology center, it would be really great to partner with the refuges and the, the parks that are on the outs, outskirts, and we have a the way our model works is we actually have a fleet of buses that we own that we are able to take kids to where we need to go, which is often a stumbling block. So it'd be lovely to talk with you or anyone else again in the room, I don't know who's here, um, related to that type of partnership. Super. But the amount of money that it would require to create those urban centers is actually not very significant. So it'd be interesting to talk to somebody about that. So Great. thanks. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Let me invite up uh, the next panel. Miles Keough, uh, the Executive Director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies. Dr. Sumida Khatri, did I get that close? Okay. Uh, with the American Lung Association and Mandy Warner uh, with the Environmental Defense Fund. Thank you, welcome. Mr. Keough, go ahead, kick us off. You've got five minutes. Thank you so much. This is actually my second rodeo doing this. And um, to repay your kindness for the last time that I came, um, I have some uh, written uh, remarks, but uh, I know you know I can read, and I know you can read, so I I'm not going to read them. Um, I'll uh, speak a little bit extemporaneously, but I'll, I'll kind of try to make it uh, worth your time. Uh, as much as possible. Thank you so much again to you and to the other members of the subcommittee uh, for letting me speak today. Uh, you mentioned I'm Miles Keough. I run the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, which convenes 155 of the state and local uh, uh, air pollution and climate agencies uh, across the country. Um, and I'm testifying today because those agencies, which have the primary responsible responsibility under the Clean Air Act for protecting your constituents uh, from air pollution, um, they get a lot of their funding through appropriations that uh, y'all uh, consider and authorize. Um, those agencies which uh, are coastal and heartland, uh, urban and rural, every stripe of politics, uh, those agencies have received level funding for a long time. In fact, the, they continue to receive today the same level of funding that they received 15 years ago in 2004 uh, during the George W. Bush administration. NACA's ask for every state and local agency in every state of the country um, is uh, for the House, for y'all, to help appropriate an additional $87 million this year to the state and local category grants under Sections 103 and 105 of the Clean Air Act. That's a 15-year inflation adjustment. And I came in last year and asked for a 14-year inflation adjustment. Um, the needs are, are greater than that. Uh, in 2007, we asked the agencies what they needed, um, and that was, you know, it's 15 years at the same level, and the numbers were, were more than double uh, what they were receiving. But adjusting for inflation would go a long way. So I remember from last year, I know what you're thinking, why should you all give any more money to the clean air agencies for this work, right? I mean, obviously, you can do it with level funding, because you're doing it and you've been doing it. So, so why should we consider increasing the money? Um, in fact, uh, there's five ways in which um, your districts uh, would benefit from having these agencies get more, uh, uh, get an increase in the funding. The first is that um, at the current level, there is an impediment to business development. 
when the agencies are stretched as they are over 15 years of, of operating with the same funding, it delays the time that we can approve projects as being in line with the law. It slows down how fast we can get permits out the door, it impedes investment, it slows economic growth, and it slows job creation. So this is a real thing. Uh, it's hard to tally what that number actually is, but uh, holding things steady over that time has had an effect. Second, um, it shifts that spending to your states. There's not that many sources of money in the world, so uh, where the federal money doesn't show up, uh, it's citizens in your district that backfill the difference. And that's, what, that's a lot of what's happened. Third is that um, the public uh, demands more information and more effort than we needed in previous years. Um, we now find out about air quality in our weather apps. There's greater uh, clean air awareness thanks to uh, uh, wildfires. There's an explosion in sensor data. And there's a bunch of new pollutants, things like um, uh, ethylene oxide and PFAS and the like that we just didn't have the same understanding years ago as we do now. Fourth, if you have ambitions to comprehensively reduce greenhouse gas emissions, those are going to involve state and local agencies. If you want to do that in the future, the time to invest in those agencies is now. And then finally, and by far most importantly, even though more people are protected from air pollution today, we still have non-attainment areas and we still have people exposed to air toxics. There's still limits to the work that we could be doing and constraining the ability of air agencies to provide services to the public. It narrows our reach and limits the, the protection we can provide your constituents. We don't know how many environmental justice programs we're not doing. We don't know how many communities we're not reaching. And the fact is that while clean air is a huge success story, it's still an unfinished story. More Americans still die from air pollution than from car crashes or from gun, vi uh, gun violence. And about a third of Americans still breathe unhealthy air for about a third of the year. So again, the ask is for an additional $87 million to adjust for 15 years of holding a study on the paycheck. I thank you for your time. And if you have questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you. Dr. Katri. Good afternoon. Hello, uh, Ranking Member Joyce. I'm a Buckeye too, thanks. Um, Mr. Kilmer and others in the room, um, I'm, thank you for uh, offering us the opportunity to testify in front of your subcommittee. I'm coming to you, my name is Shmita Khatri. I'm a board member of the American Lung Association and I'm also a, a lung physician and also a member of the community and it's in these realms that I'm here for you today. The um, mission of the American Lung Association is to improve lung health and prevent lung disease and how that uh, mixes in with air quality, so thank you for the segue prior. So I'm here to urge this subcommittee to increase in its investment in the US EPA air quality programs. It's the 50th anniversary of the Clean Air Act, and there's opportunity to do even more than has already been um, done. There is much more to be done because you can't have too healthy air. In order for us to deliver on our promise for the Clean Air Act, um, if we fund further, there are so many things we can do. For instance, um, build upon the EPA air quality management system that's already in place, which is keeping track of what air quality is going on, so that we can all be informed citizens. Two, EPA's grants to states and tribes to do what needs to be done individually based on what the community needs are after you've done the research to figure out and have these partnerships. Three, monitoring and enforcement. Unless we monitor, we don't know what we're needing to do next. And enforcement, because we need to be held accountable, whatever the uh, origin of those air quality um, alerts are coming from. And then, of course, the EPA's climate protection program, because after decades of progress, we're seeing some um, backslides due to changes in climate, as you mentioned, in the wildfires. So my written comments outline um, more in detail what we're asking for specifically, but I'd like to highlight how the EPA has helped me be, be better at all the three realms that I discussed earlier. I live in Cleveland, and although the air, don't even talk about the river, okay, but <laughs> um, when uh, Cleveland used to have worse air quality, but it's gotten a lot better, and part of how we're being able to do that is through the um, state implementation plans, looking at what the sources of air pollution are, and um, not only is it industry, but it's also transportation. So um, I have to mention a story. I do a lot of outreach. I just don't stay in my four walls as a clinician. I, I partner with air quality agencies, and I have a really compelling story about a very um, proactive bus fleet manager in a large public school 
system who decided that he wanted to be part of the solution. And so he applied for the diesel particulate filter uh, funding grants, and he took about 300 buses over six years and retrofitted them with uh, diesel particulate filters. And the air quality, not just outside improved, but inside. We actually rode those buses and did some air quality monitoring, and we saw that. So about 10 years ago, when my kids started going to school, you'll be sure to know that as I waved goodbye to them, I was actually making sure that the DPF was down. They're like, what are you doing, Mom? I'm like, never mind, it's good for you. Um, so that's one, um, one thing that I know that we're doing well with these programs. The second thing is that um, having publicly available databases with air quality metrics like the AQS data mark, that lets people who are epidemiologists like me look and see whether there's associations from a timing standpoint with asthma visits to the ED or even doing panel studies looking at inflammation in their upper airways, pe people with asthma who demonstrate that more. So having this publicly available data available allows for us to do this research. And then finally, as a clinician, I'm able to have these conversations. They know what they're breathing, and it doesn't feel good. There's the canaries in the coal mine. And having conversations around air quality index and what they can do when they should exercise, what they can do in their own environments to think uh, how to have a healthier lifestyle can be improved. Those are all important. So I already mentioned about how climate change is having these extreme weather events, and not only are the pe people getting sicker in these areas, but the people who are trying to deliver medical care, they're experiencing challenges. So all of these things are important that we talk about. So thank you very much. We appreciate all of the progress that has been made through the EPA, but I call on you to further fund the EPA, and we have all of those details available for you so that we as clinicians can do a job well done, too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Warner. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank Chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and Representative Kilmer and other members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mandy Warner. I'm a Senior Manager for Climate and Air Policy at Environmental Defense Fund. EDF is an international and environmental advocacy organization with 2.5 million members nationwide. While there's numerous priorities for EDF within interior and environment appropriations that are critical to public health, uh, my remarks today are specifically focused on the Environmental Protection Agency's proposal related to the mercury and air toxic standards for power plants. EDF is respectfully asking the Interior Environment Subcommittee to include a provision to direct EPA to complete a report that fully assesses this proposal's impacts on Americans. Specifically, we recommend EPA complete an analysis of the impacts of its math proposal that includes a comprehensive assessment of its potential public health, economic, and environmental consequences. That study must include an analysis of the costs and benefits of the administrator's proposed revised supplemental finding and of any rescission, invalidation, or termination of MATS, as well as a study of the actual cost to industry of complying with MATS since it has been implemented. This analysis will better inform the public and Congress of the issues at stake in the MATS proposal. Remarkably, <coughs> EPA proposed to find control of power plant mercury and air toxics emissions is not appropriate without doing any such study. And despite a massive record showing the grave harms that these pollutants cause to society, including children and vulnerable populations. As background, in 2011, EPA finalized standards to reduce mercury and other toxic air pollution, including lead, chromium, arsenic, and soot from coal and oil fired power plants. Power plants were the single largest source of toxic mercury emissions in the U.S. and emit over 80 hazardous air pollutants. These pollutants are known to cause cancer, birth and reproductive impacts, respiratory and cardiovascular impacts, impaired brain development in children, and other harms to human health. Leading up to the finalization of the standards, EPA assessed the benefits and costs associated with implementing the rule, finding up to 11,000 lives would be saved every year, along with avoiding 130,000 asthma attacks among children and other health harms. This analysis demonstrated that the benefits outweigh the cost of implementing the standards by a margin of up to 9 to 1. And subsequent to finalization and implementation of MATS, many studies have further quantified and monetized reductions of mercury, finding that the benefits are indeed orders of magnitude higher than EPA had estimated. And it's now also clear that EPA and industry overestimated the cost of compliance with the standards. The power sector is meeting MATS and has achieved an 86% reduction in mercury, an 81% reduction in other metals, and a 96% reduction in acid gases since 2010. Unfortunately, in 2018, EPA proposed to reverse the agency's prior foundational finding that MATS is appropriate and necessary, which could potentially undermine these already implemented and widely supported standards. EPA presented no scientific evidence to suggest it was not appropriate to regulate power plants' hazardous air pollution. 
EPA also declined to update its analysis of the costs and benefits of the rule and instead inappropriately relied on the 2011 regulatory impact analysis. Numerous public commenters noted that the substantial peer-reviewed research documenting greater health effects of mercury and analysis, quantifying and monetizing <coughs> benefits of reducing mercury emissions that were not considered in EPA's 2018 proposal. This deficiency was also noted by the EPA's Science Advisory Board in a draft report addressed to Administrator Wheeler in October 2019. For example, as EPA admitted at the time, the agency's 2011 RIA was only able to quantify and monetize a small subset of a subset of the impacts of methylmercury exposure. More recent studies have shown that there's significant new analysis EPA could draw from to assess the full array of benefits <coughs> from implementing the standards. A comprehensive report from leading independent environmental economists released in December 2019 also found that EPA's approach greatly underestimated the public health benefits associated with reducing mercury emissions and that a new retrospective and prospective benefit cost analysis could better represent the impacts of the MATS rule. Furthermore, the public health and environmental community is not alone in objecting to EPA's harmful and scientifically unsupported proposal. EPA's proposal has been widely opposed, including by the power sector and labor leaders who have asked EPA to leave the standards in place and effective. Also, the House of Representatives has expressed bipartisan opposition to the 2018 MATS proposal with the House Interior EPA funding bill for fiscal year 2020 having included an amendment that would have blocked EPA from finalizing this proposal. I want to thank you again for your consideration of the MATS study proposal and we look forward to working with the committee on this important matter. So I'll just ask a quick question of all three of you. We have things that I looked at them. Where are you, I mean, some of this is appropriations, making sure that there's the funding to do the right analysis, the funding to do the right studies, the funding to do the enforcement. That's kind of the, the, the place we're at. Do you have any, um, and the amendments can come on the floor and be in order for some of the things, but do you have anything moving through Energy and Commerce and the Authorizations co uh, Committee that Mr. George and I should be looking at to see whether or not there's um, a funding attachment to them and be aware of it? I, I don't know that we have anything formally going through those committees. However, I think the clean energy sector certainly helps us with improving our air quality. And so um, any collaborations we can make in that regard would be helpful. I think the, the lens through which I came uh, representing ALA is the fact that it's a broad issue, the air quality, and it doesn't even affect only those people with chronic lung diseases, but right. can develop it as well. So I think knowledge is power is the key to this, and, and giving the communities the empowered empowerment to sort of partner and change their environment, that's that's the lens through which I came. So perhaps that didn't come through as, as clearly. No, no, it, it did. I was just wondering if you had um, any, any other, you know, we're not, the only tool in the congressional toolbox that, that, that you're looking at to, to bring these um, uh, issues either to awareness, mm -hmm. to, um, uh, you know, sometimes there's environmental justice bills going through, there's other hearings happening. I was just wondering if there was anything that I, as a member of Congress, should be talking to some of my counterparts in, in either energy and commerce or any of the other but you can that. get back to us. That sure. would be helpful. Uh, we do not have uh, anything attached to any other legislation. Um, implementing the Clean Air Act is a pretty clear swim lane, uh, I think so. and the state and local agencies have uh, these category grants. So um, you are you are the dance partner that we, mm -hmm. that we for the come grants. With. So uh, that's but, that's where we're at. But 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 for the grants, but for some of the other things. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any um, uh, advocacy work that we have with energy and commerce related to the mercury stuff that I talked about, but I'm happy to follow up with you as well okay. about that. Thank you for mm -hmm. that question. Yeah. 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 Yes, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Where are you from? So we've heard about. Um, <laughs> we've heard from uh, the EPA Clean Air Panel. Now we're going to hear from the EPA Clean Water Panel. Mm -hmm. 
So um, if you would, and we won't count it against your time, just take a moment, introduce yourself, and then go into your testimony. We'll go, go through. We found out that that kind of saves time and gets people back on track, and you've waited throughout a vote, so we appreciate it, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Please start. Okay, so um, I'm Ann Mesnikoff. I'm the, oh, sorry. Yeah, the red button has to be on. Got it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ann Mesnikoff. I'm the Federal Legislative Director for the Environmental Law and Policy Center. ELPC is based in the Great Lakes region with offices in seven Midwest states and here in D.C. Thank you, Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, Representative Kilmer, for the opportunity uh, to testify today in support of the popular bipartisan Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We greatly appreciate the leadership of this committee that resulted in the program receiving $320 million for this fiscal year. The Great Lakes are a global gem and contain 21% of the world's fresh water. They supply uh, 42 million people with safe drinking water. The Great Lakes support a $7 billion annual fishing industry, and recreation draws millions of tourists who, boast, who boost the economies of shoreline communities. In short, the Great Lakes are where many millions live, work, and play. I'll make three points today. First, the Great Lakes Restor Restoration Initiative is vitally important and successful. It is a model federal program providing great benefits, and it is working well. As the GLRI's third action plan notes, the GLRI ha has been a catalyst for unprecedented federal agency coordination, which has in turn produced unprecedented results. Congress's recognition of the effectiveness of the program is reflected in the bipartisan support to re uh, reject the President's proposed budget cuts for this successful program and instead restored full funding for FY 2018, 19, and an increase in FY 20. Yesterday on the House floor, many members spoke to the benefits of GLRI across the Great Lakes, and my written testimony details a range of projects and prog the program covers and highlights several examples of successful projects documented by our partners at Healing Our Waters Coalition. Importantly, GLRI projects bring together a broad array of partners to do the work to achieve GLRI's goals and create jobs. The program delivers significant regional economic value. Second, even as we applaud the success of GLRI, we need to recognize the new and evolving threats the Great Lakes face from climate change, the increases of palmal algal blooms, to this administration's attack on the Clean Water Act. These combined threats mean we need to uh, protect the Great Lakes now more now than ever. Last spring, ELPC issued a report authored by top climate experts from Midwest universities including the University of Minnesota and Ohio State University. The report found that climate change is causing significant and far-reaching impacts across the region. Among the impacts particularly relevant to GLRI is the finding that climate change is contributing to a more dramatic pattern of fluctuating lake levels compared to historic patterns. Annual precipitation in the lakes region has increased at a higher percentage than the rest of the country. And more of this precipitation is occurring in unusually large events. The lakes remain at dangerously high levels, bringing flooding, impacting infrastructure, and increased polluted runoff. We need to recognize the role climate change is playing and will play across the region with attention to resilience, protecting shorelines, wetlands restoration, and other projects that GLRI supports. Changes in precipitation patterns are also contributing to the growing challenge of algal blooms, which threaten public health, drinking water and treatment costs, and impact recreation and fishing. In just the Maumee River watershed, a priority watershed for GLRI, the estimated number of animals in the region tripled over the last 10 years. We used satellite imagery to count and measure CAFOs in the Maumee watershed to estimate the number of animals and the amount of manure these facilities produce and concluded that in 2018 alone, CAFOs produced 3.5 million tons of manure fueling Lake Erie's excess nutrient load. GLRI supports strategies to reduce this harmful runoff, but even as these programs are implemented, the number of animals and industrial farms is on the rise. Finally, the lakes face new threats from critical rollbacks of rules intended to protect clean water. The recently announced Navigable Waters Protection Act will leave rain-dependent streams and large percentage of wetlands unprotected. EPA's own Science Advisory Board's draft letter was deeply critical of the analysis supporting the final rule. This rollback, along with the proposed changes to the state, uh, proposed changes to state's authority under Section 401 of the Clean Water Act, could also increase challenges to the lakes. And finally, third, I made, made a slight uh, amendment. Uh, I need to make a slight amendment to my written testimony because, again, as me members spoke in support of GLRI yesterday, they also passed the GLRI Act of 2019. ELPC supports this bill and the important goal of funding GLRI at 475 million. 
but given the urgency of protecting the lakes, we request that this committee consider increasing funding for the program to that level for FY 2021. This increase would be both a down payment toward the implementation of the reauthorization and a recognition of the challenges the Great Lakes face. Thank you again for the opportunity to uh, testify today in support of GLRI. So thanks for in advance for your time today. Thanks, um, Chairman McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce and Committee Member Kilmer. This is a first for me. Um, so my name is Erin Sexton, and I'm a senior scientist at the University of Montana Flathead Lake Biological Station. I'm here to discuss the important issue of mine contamination from British Columbia flowing downriver into Alaska, Washington, Montana, and Idaho. I've spent the last two decades studying the impacts of large-scale mining and transboundary rivers. I live and work with my family just outside of Glacier National Park and live near two of these big transboundary rivers, the Flathead and the Kootenai Watershed. Both of these rivers have their headwaters in southeast British Columbia and are underlain by some of the world's largest metallurgical coal deposits. I'm here today because there's a critical need for federal funding to address the issue of BC mining impacts to our downstream states. This for, funding- for, for the record, BC's British Columbia. Yes, I'm sorry, British Columbia. British Columbia, Canada. Um, this funding is an investment up front to ensure accountability so that our communities in Washington, Idaho, Alaska, and Montana do not pay the price for long-term damages from Canadian mines. Mines in British Columbia leaching into western states creates a unique problem for our state, tribal, and federal governments. We are collectively outside of the decision-making process and excluded from environmental assessments and mine permits that directly impact our rivers. In Montana and Idaho, Mines owned by Tech Coal in southeast BC are right now delivering mine waste into, into our Kootenai River watershed, and they are already impacting water quality and fish. In Washington State, Imperial Metals seeks to build a giant copper mine in the headwaters of the Skagit River. And in Alaska, there are more than 12 operating and proposed mines that threaten some of our last remaining wild salmon rivers. All four states share the common problem of British Columbia mines jeopardizing downstream economies, water quality, fish, and communities. In years of working on transboundary mines and sorting through the environmental process in British Columbia, I have learned that we cannot trust their laws to protect our waters. In British Columbia, the mining company leads every aspect of the EA, from data collection to assessment of impact to selecting the mitigation. In short, letting a mining company write their own environmental assessment is business as usual for British Columbia, but represents a substantial downgrading of our own environmental laws. Fifteen years ago, when I started sampling water quality downstream of Tex Elk Valley mines in southeast BC, I found significantly elevated levels of selenium, nitrates, and other contaminants, all well above healthy environmental thresholds. We saw evidence from fishing outfitters of fish with missing gills and birds with two beaks, common deformities resulting from selenium toxicity. Given these impacts and clear increasing contaminant trends, I expected to see a moratorium on new mines, pending effective mitigations, and regulatory enforcement. Instead, with this data in hand, British Columbia permitted the expansion of four open pit coal mines in the Elk Valley and Kootenai watershed. Rather than enforcing water quality guidelines, they rewrote the management plan, increasing water limits to accommodate rising contaminant levels. Tech Coal's mitigations have repeatedly failed, and we now have decades of mine waste leaching into Montana and Idaho, over 150 miles downriver from the mines. This year, USGS, US EPA, and the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho are trying to cobble together funding to verify those findings and expand their study. In FY19 and 20, with funding from Interior Appropriations, USGS took a first pass at baseline data at the international boundary of the states bordering British Columbia. They did this by installing um, higher grade gauges at the international boundary. To date, EPA has not received funding to address this issue, despite being a lead entity across all four states and providing a critical link to our states and tribes. Data gathered with those initial dollars in FY19 and 20 shows a need for a substantial long-term funding investment to our interior agencies. A conservative estimate would be $16 million over five years across Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. This funding will allow us to lead our own science, establish our own baseline, evaluate impacts, and proactively ensure protection and rehabilitation of these rivers. We can build a long-term strategy which can include assessment of damages and assignment of accountability north of the border. 
the call for resolution on this issue has been loud and clear. Last year, eight U.S. senators from the four downstream states wrote a joint letter to B.C. Premier Horgan demanding action. The letter followed on a rising chorus from affected tribes expressing deep concerns about impacts to tribal treaty rights and lands. The response from Premier Horgan was insufficient and notably lacked any mention of financial assurances or accountability to downstream states. A robust commitment to, uh, to federal-led science is imperative to U.S. efforts to achieve meaningful and lasting resolution to this issue and ultimately to ensure that the cost of this contamination isn't paid by downstream communities in Idaho, Montana, Washington, and Alaska. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Joyce, Representative Kilmer. My name is John Rumpler, and I'm Senior Attorney and Clean Water Program Director for Environment America. Uh, Madam Chair, if I can indulge for just a moment, I just want to recall uh, of all the elected officials that I have ever had the privilege to hear speak on the importance of clean water, when you and I shared a stage in March of 2014, 200 plus people on a hearing on the clean water rule in St. Paul, oh. you were the one who better than anyone captured what clean water means for America, for our ecosystem and our citizens, and I remember it to this day. Thank you. Um, I'm here to testify in support of dramatic increases that are urgently needed in the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund. As a national organization working to protect the places we love and promote core environmental values, Environment America believes that we have to fund the water infrastructure that our environment deserves and our health demands. And as a citizen-based network of state groups in 29 states, we know the public agrees. Mm -hmm. Now, Congress nearly 50 years ago when we passed the Clean Water Act made a promise to the nation that our waters would be safe for swimming. Yet here we are all these years later and we still have billions of gallons of sewage overflows and runoff pollution plaguing Lake Erie, plaguing uh, the, the, the rivers, uh, including the Mississippi River in Minnesota, plaguing Puget Sound. We need to solve this problem. Just to underscore, last summer in our report, Safe for Swimming, my researchers found widespread fecal bacteria contamination in beaches across America. And in fact, health experts estimate there are 57 million instances of Americans getting sick each year from swimming in our waters. Gastroenteritis, skin rashes, ear infections, et cetera. This is clearly not what we meant when we said, let's make our waters safe for swimming right here in Congress with the Clean Water Act. Moreover, these problems are likely to get worse with climate change exacerbating storms and flooding. To give you one recent example, a stormwater, uh, a sewage facility rather, that was flooded in Nebraska has been releasing over a million gallons of sewage every day since last spring because it's been knocked out of capacity. In addition to these challenges, we now have new challenges facing our wa wastewater infrastructure from PFAS to microplastics to pharmaceutical waste. Now I have to ask you, if the American Society of Civil Engineers has given our wastewater infrastructure a recent grade of D+, how on earth are we going to secure clean water if we don't step it up with dramatically increased funding. EPA estimates that to solve our wastewater problems, it's going to take an investment of $271 billion over the next 20 years. Current levels do not even approach that. But Environment America, along with 20 other organizations, are urging Congress to triple the SRF level up to $6 billion per year so that we can have safe, clean water. But it's not just our waterways that are at risk, it is also our drinking water. And let me talk primarily right now about the threat of lead contamination. Unfortunately, over the course of a century, we built our pipes and a lot of our fixtures with a potent neurotoxin that harms the way that our kids learn, behave, and grow. And now I have to tell you, we have a national epidemic of drinking water contamination by lead. And I don't just mean in communities like Flint or Newark. 
Researchers have found lead in water at the tap at 2,000 water systems in all 50 states. Rural, suburban, it's everywhere. We know that lead harms the way that our kids develop, so we have got to deal with this problem. To stop this toxic contamination, job one is removing lead service lines. These toxic pipes are the leading source of lead water contamination wherever they are. EPA now estimates there are 9.3 million of them out there. The price tag to remove them all, which health officials say we must do, is now estimated at approximately $45 billion. State and local rate payers are not going to be able to bear that burden alone. The longer we here in the federal government wait for a substantial investment, the longer our kids are going to be drinking water tainted with lead. And let me assure you that it is our kids, because in fact, our research through our Get the Lead Out campaign has found not just in our homes with lead service lines, but in schools across the country, a high percentage in Washington state, a high percentage in Ohio and states across the country, lead contamination of drinking water in our schools is pervasive. And I can get you that data from about 20 states that have done uh, various levels of testing so far. We need to help our schools get the lead out so that our kids can learn and grow up safely every day where we send them to learn and grow. How do we do that? Well, schools need to start removing old water fountains that have lead in them and uh, water fountains and put on uh, filters that are certified to remove lead. That's going to take a lot of resources, and schools that are you know, strapped for their budgets are not going to be able to do it al alone. So again, this is going to require a substantial, unprecedented federal commitment to say we are not going to tolerate the contamination of our water with a potent neurotoxin that makes our kids sick. Now, I should say lead is not the only problem that we need to face with drinking water. We've heard about PFAS, uh, toxic chemicals and toxic metals getting into our waterways. Um, EPA estimates overall that we're going to need 400 and $72 billion over the next 20 years just to maintain our current drinking water infrastructure. Are you about done? I'm just about to finish. I just wanted to add, Madam Chairman, if I can, that clean, safe water is the hallmark of advanced society. And for too long, we've taken that for granted, and now America has fallen short. But if we can take this opportunity to make a historic investment in clean water, we can bring back the promise of clean water for all Americans. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Is it okay to give you a, a couple of pictures? We love handouts. I'm Rich Innes. Uh, I am the. Um, oh, that's right. You missed your your stone. <laughs> um, my name is Rich Innes. I'm the um, uh, Senior Policy Director of the Association of National Estuary Programs. My, uh, my association with the NEPs goes back to when I was fortunate enough to be a staffer on the Senate Environment Committee when we were doing the 87 amendments to the Clean Water Act, which created the program. Um, and I'm sure that the uh, champions of the program at that time, including my boss, Senator John Chafee, um, George Mitchell of Maine, and uh, uh, Pat Moynihan uh, would be very proud of how this program has flourished. Um, I want to particularly uh, thank uh, Representative Kilmer for inviting uh, both the chair and the ranking member uh, to see firsthand um, uh, one of our premier national estuary programs, the Puget Sound. And while I'm sure you saw, it is absolutely stunningly beautiful and breathtaking, framed by Mount St. Helena, uh, with the, surrounded by the um, uh, lands that belong to Chief Seattle, uh, the ancestral lands. It is trouble underneath, um, and there are a world of problems uh, that the National Estuary Program, together with many other partners, the Puget Sound Partnership, is uh, addressing out there. Um, the, the way that that started is the way that all of our estuary programs have started, and that is with uh, the commitment and support of a few very strong committed citizens. 
In this case, it was some of your former colleagues, um, uh, then Representative and now Governor Jay Inslee, um, the Chairman Emeritus of this committee, who will always be Mr. Chairman to me, and that is Norm Dix, um, uh, my uh, uh, lifelong mentor and very dear friend, uh, Bill Ruckelshaus, who uh, passed recently, and, uh, and, uh, um, and the legendary tribal leader, Billy Frank Jr. I hope you got a chance to see the, uh, the, the wildlife refuge named in his honor while you were out there. It is beautiful. Um, so uh, the way that I'm, I'm really so glad you got a chance to see that, that is being replicated 28 uh, times around the country for the 28 National Estuary Programs. And each one of them has its own story to tell. Um, uh, with modest funding, which we greatly appreciate uh, from this committee, and not just this committee, this is generations of this committee that have been very supportive of this program. Uh, it, has, uh, uh, it has hit well above its weight. Um, uh, the examples here are, are too numerous, uh, to, but I'm going to mention a few of them. Uh, uh, the Delaware NEP, where I spend a great deal of time, um, is bringing back the oyster. And it's appearing on tables and in restaurants, and it's also cleaning, cleaning the bay. Um, which is a major accomplishment. Um, the New York, New York, New Jersey Harbor, um, uh, one of our great economic ports, is degraded, as I think we all know. And, uh, and the NEP there, along with many partners, is spearheading a plan to revive and resuscitate um, that great port. Uh, the San Francisco Bay uh, NEP um, is a, uh, uh, that, that, estuary suffered dramatically from indiscriminate filling of, of San Francisco Bay for decades. And what the NEP now is doing is changing that. They are addressing it along with Save the Bay, along with many partners, um, in order to restore and recapture the beauty of that bay. Um, uh, Casco Bay in Maine, I'm sorry that um, Shelley isn't here but uh, um, it is uh, doing incredible work up there to reduce nitrate and nit nitrite loadings uh, into the bay. And of course, the Puget Sound Partnership, the NEP up there, uh, is in the forefront of the governor's efforts to save the orcas, and I'm sure you learned a great deal about that when you were out there. Um, the iconic uh, black and white fish, um, they are down to 72. Um, uh, they just lost another one uh, within the last few days. Um, so the, the, the red light is, um, is blinking there. Um, the, uh, uh, I want to just take one moment to talk about a special one, Tampa Bay, just because it, it is such a poster child. And uh, Tampa Bay was essentially dead um, in the 1980s. 80% um, uh, of the um, uh, seagrasses were gone, and almost half of the wetlands were gone out of Tampa Bay. The National Estuary Program down there, again, I don't want to say that they did this by themselves. They didn't. It was a partnership that is the model that NEPs employ where they get citizens, businesses together in order to, uh, uh, to muster the political will and the funding, which you have been so helpful with, uh, to restore these places that we love and care about. Um, right now, Tampa Bay is considered a world-class model for estuary restoration. And, and it didn't come about easily. It took decades for us to get there. The work isn't done, but it is a stellar example. Um, uh, yesterday, there was some very good news, as we heard some of it, the Great Lakes. Uh, um, bill, thank you for passing that. Also, the, uh, a bill reauthorizing the National Estuary Program, H.R. 4044, was approved overwhelmingly uh, by this body, and, uh, and we greatly appreciate that. Norm Dix, when he was chair of this committee, uh, lamented publicly on a hearing similar to this um, that the NEPs were doing so much with so little. And uh, at that point, I think we were getting about 400,000 per NEP. Now, thanks to you, it's up to a little over 600,000. Um, yesterday's bill that passed on the floor of the House would uh, increase the authorization amount to $1 million per NEP and continue to put $4 million into a competitive fund used to address things like ocean acidification in the Hood Canal, um, uh, algae blooms, which as you know are uh, harmful algae blooms, are a major, major problem. Um, so anyway, I'm going to end there. 
I just want to thank all of you for your uh, continued support. Thank you. Well, Mr. Joyce, uh, you've gotten a lot of uh, kudos for, for the Great Lakes Bill. Um, and uh, people have talked about authorizing amounts. Um, when, this, when our last bill that Mr. Joyce and I worked on left here at the House, it, le it uh, had a uh, billion point three more dollars in it than when it came back from conference wow. committee. And so we're trying to do our level best to um, work with our authorizers and, and uh, their suggested amounts because we all think that they're wonderful, but um, we don't have an open pocketbook here. So, um, so what we're trying to do is uh, utilize you and the testimony today for to ask uh, our leadership for a bigger allocation. <laughs> Uh, so thank you all for helping to do that. I would um, just like to uh, throw something on the table here to, to just discuss briefly. One of the challenges that I find with water is everybody knows we need it. Everybody drinks it. Some people like to recreate in it. We eat food from there. Some people like to just enjoy a sailboat on it. But when you ask people what water is worth, they say it's priceless. But then when it comes to some of the runoff, when it comes to some of the pollution that, that you referred to, Ms. Ms. Sexton, we get into this cost-benefit analysis. Oh, and we need the minerals. We need this. And that's all very true. But I think we need to be conservative. And as you pointed out, Mr. Rumpler, everybody's for clean water. They're willing to pay for clean water. What are we missing that there's still a disconnect that water has a significant important value to it because when you don't value it you will pollute it and i grew up in a river town the mississippi river when the stockyards first opened up they just washed everything out into the river because the river would wash it downstream don't have to look with it dilution was the solution to the pollution and eventually it choked off and killed that section of the Mississippi River. Stockyards are gone. Um, uh, we, we, we mourn the loss of the jobs, but we don't mourn the loss of the pollution when the river's making uh, a comeback. There's also some other issues with our sanitary sewer system there too. So any suggestions about um, what you're doing to raise public awareness that water has a value so that when People talk about water. Um, they also have in the back of their mind a value to it besides just, oh, it's here, it's accessible, it's never going away. Madam Chair, I have two thoughts on that. One is I think <coughs> the U.S. Water Alliance actually has a whole public education program called the Value of Water. Um, so uh, perhaps there would be some resources there about how to remind people that water has value. Uh, but I would say, um, although this is a little bit beyond the purview of the Appropriations Committee, that there's a direct um, relationship between our regulatory regimes to protect our waterways and prevent pollution versus how much money we have to spend on the back end cleaning it up. And as we all know, it's cheaper to prevent, right? So if we could maintain stronger clean water protections, for example, federal jurisdiction over our wetlands and uh, streams that provide drinking water to hundreds of millions of Americans, uh, or 117 million Americans, I should say, uh, will have less cost on the back end to clean up pollution. ELPC has done polling uh, in, in various parts of our, where we operate in the Great Lakes region to assess how people are viewing the value of clean water and understanding some of the particular sources that affect their access to clean water in their area because it's different you know, sources depending on where people are. Um, and then using that to, to help educate people about the importance of, 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 of clean water protection, clean water regulation. So we're doing that and I can share that polling with Desai and others. A major part of the um, mission of the National Estuary Program is environmental education. And it starts when when folks are young 
uh, but continues. One of the um, uh, benchmarks of a successful plan is that it includes businesses um, and, the, and the general public in buy into these programs. Um, we've seen the enemy, the enemy is us. M the majority of pollution of water right now, as we know, is coming from non-point source pollution runoff. It is coming from the fertilizers we're putting in our lawns, from agriculture, from the cars we drive. It is no longer the big, bad um, uh, industrial polluter uh, as it was uh, when we first passed the Clean Water Act. And so that is going to involve um, all of us in a real public education campaign um, in how to uh, uh, value and cherish something as um, uh, essential uh, to human life as water. Okay, um, I just want, I'm just gonna make one quick comment before I turn it over to Mr. Joyce. Um, I'm dealing with uh, an issue that's, that's reverse flow than what you're dealing with with the Canadians, Ms. Exum, because of the Laurentian divide. So, so when you teach social studies, geography is part of it, so I have to get the map up and in our part of the our part of the world, the water flows north, and so we're dealing with copite, uh, sulfur copite ore mining, uh, and uh, I'm sure the Canadians don't want anything going into Quantico Bay. So just as we don't, I, I want to work to to save the pristine waters, waters in the boundary waters, where you can literally put this glass in, take it out, and drink it. Uh, and uh, all the mines, this just isn't one mine, all the mining permits that can go along in, in that area. And it, one mistake and it's over. There's, there's no going back. So I appreciate the fact that you mentioned um, your challenge with the Canadians. I'm planning on meeting with um, some of um, our counterparts in Canada. And um, one of the things that I've highlighted with permitting these mines is we need to be mindful of the 19, it's a uh, 1908 Boundary Waters Treaty, I think 1909, I did have the date correct. Um, and the, the water flows both ways on that. So you gave me some ammunition, and I will, I will be using it. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Joyce. Thank you all for uh, coming here today and your information, and Aaron, I thought you did a hell of a job for your first time out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I want to thank all of you as well. Um, and uh, Mr. Innes, uh, thanks for highlighting the Puget Sound Partnership and the work they do. As you, as you all pointed out, last year uh, we saw an increase in National Estuary Program funds. We saw uh, an increase in funds for the Puget Sound Geographic Program. I want to thank our chairwoman uh, for her leadership and partnership and advocacy in making that happen. Puget Sound is just so vital to our economy, to our environment. Um, and as you pointed out, it's uh, beautiful but sick. Um, uh, talk about how increased funding will help us move the needle on yes. recovery. So the, um, a, as you're well aware, Congressman, um, the, the, each of the NEPs developed something called a comprehensive management plan. In Puget Sound, it's called the Action Agenda. And um, it, it has, a tremendous amount of buy-in, and this goes back to Bill Ruckel's house, his shared shared strategy. Um, uh, uh, so now you've got a a, um, uh, a very dynamic, um, very well conceived uh, plan for uh, uh, for achieving the cleanup goals for Puget Sound, and there is no substitute for funding, and, uh, and it doesn't it isn't all federal. I have to say that the state of Washington is putting in an enormous amount of money, more than the federal contribution, um, uh, and, and also private industry. Um, we've got NGOs that are very engaged in this. The tribal contribution is enormous as well. Um, but, it, but the price tag, we, we made a decision. I, I, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but the, the figures were so big and so staggering that good advice was, don't put out there that it's going to take $2 billion to recover this because that might scare people off. Um, to make it more uh, bite size, um, but there is no substitute for, um, uh, for some of the investments that need to be made. Um, they're expensive. They are culverts, um, uh, replacing culverts um, to restore streams. Um, there are uh, water treatment. Uh, 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 anyway, it is expensive. 
and uh, uh, I do have to say that in the NEPs in general, in Puget Sound in particular, um, that investment is put to extremely good purpose and goes a long way. So thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Well, we'll have our next uh, panel come up. Thank you so much. Oh, I love maps. for helping out. Appreciate it. Well, welcome. So you know the drill probably better than anybody else. You're the last panel. So I want to thank you so much for your patience, your due diligence, uh, putting up with the vote. And um, we're anxious to hear your testimony. So um, Ms. Murdoch, if you want to introduce yourself, we won't count that against your time. Thank you. Saves time and you. go into your testimony. Hello, um, my name is Alex Murdoch and I'm the Vice President of Policy for American Forests. Um, thank you very much for having us today, uh, Chairman McCollum, Mr. Joyce and Mr. Kilmer, thank you so much. Um, I'm here to talk with you today about our recommendations for U.S. Forest Service programs that are critical to achieving climate-informed restoration and reforestation of America's forests. So very particularly about our national forests and what they do for us with respect to our changing climate. Uh, we sincerely thank the committee for the FY20 funding levels for the Forest Service. And I'd also like to particularly appreciate the increase in funding that you provided for the urban and community forest program. And we're grateful to the committee for recognizing how important that program is. American Forest was founded in 1875 by citizens who were alarmed by the state of our forests. At that time, America was growing quickly, and we were clearing our forests to make way for new farms, towns, and railways. This development came at a price. In the 1600s, almost half of the United States was forested, and those forests provided clean water and fish and game and shelter and goods for those who lived near them. But by the start of the 20th century, we cleared over 25% of our forest land, and our drinking water was seriously at risk. Thankfully, in 1911, Congress began to protect our forests and waters by authorizing federal purchase of forested, cutover, or denuded lands to protect important watersheds. So today, national forest lands are the largest source of municipal water supply in the United States and serve 60 million people. Today, we also know that our forests play an important role in regulating our climate. In Congress and the White House now, we see emer emerging bipartisan recognition that forests and climate-informed forest management are an important strategy for mitigating climate change. <coughs> At American Forests, we agree with that consensus. Today, U.S. forests and forest products annually sequester and store 15 percent of U.S. carbon emissions from burning fossil fuels. New research suggests we could nearly double this natural carbon capture with the right actions. Managing and protecting our national forests in the changing, changing climate is a critical piece of this climate puzzle. The good news is we can do this through existing programs if proper funding levels are provided. Forester, foresters need good scientific data to manage our forests in changing climate, increased investment in the forest and rangeland research program can provide the tools for foresters to identify, prioritize, and manage climate-driven risks to forests. Foresters need to restore an estimated 80 million acres of national forests with climate-informed management practices. To do this, they need significantly increased investments in existing programs that improve forest carbon 
adaptation and resilience outcomes, both on federal lands and across boundaries. These programs include the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, the Hazardous Fuels Reduction, and Vegetation and Watershed Management Programs. Over 1.2 million acres of national forests need reforestation, a backlog that grows with every catastrophic wildfire or infestation from pests and disease. After a catastrophic event, foresters need funding to implement post-fire reforestation treatments on lands unlikely to recover naturally, as well as increased reforestation practice investments. Healthy and resilient national forests can deliver critical power to close climate change. We are greatly heartened by the optimism and enthusiasm emerging in, in our country that reforesting America is an important part of the climate puzzle. Business leaders are playing an essential and growing role by funding millions of trees planted all across America and pledging investment through the, tr the new Trillion Trees Initiative that was announced at the World Economic Forum in late January. But Congress has the power to activate the greatest single lever for quickly advancing large-scale forest carbon mitigation activities in the U.S. by significantly increasing climate-informed restoration and reforestation on our national forests. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairwoman McCollum. And, uh, Banking Member Joyce and also Representative Kilmer. My name is Terry Baker and I'm the CEO of the Society of American Foresters. Thank you for this opportunity to share how forestry, natural resource professionals, and stakeholders can work together to ensure the sustainability of our nation's forests through thoughtful investments and long-term commitment to active management, research, and partnerships. SAF is a professional society that represents over 10,000 forestry and natural resource professionals across our nation. SAF also produces two peer-reviewed scientific journals, accredits forestry and natural resource programs across, uh, at academic institutions across the nation, and helps encourage professional ex excellence through credentialing and continued education. Since our founding in 1900, forestry and foresters have evolved. Today's foresters are proud men and women and men who devoted their careers to understanding forests and trees, enhancing benefits that, that they provide, and ensuring that they continue to thrive for generations to come. In our humble opinion, we're the original green job. <laughs> and through commitment to science and innovation, we have continuously improved forestry practices and tools, lessening impacts on to the land, and improving outcomes to communities, wildlife, and society as a whole. With increasing threats and demands on our forests, no agency program or organization can do it alone. Partnerships, collaboration, and cross-boundary work is more important than ever. This is exactly why SAF wholeheartedly supports the Forest Service's shared stewardship strategy. Actively working to identify shared priorities and improve processes and procedures will benefit all stakeholders in the long run. We encourage you to support these efforts and tools that expand collaboration with rural communities, partners, and industry, such as the Good Neighbor Authority and Stewardship Contracting. We sincerely thank this subcommittee for its work in supporting and securing funds, funding increases for the Forest Service Bureau and Bureau of Land Management programs for FY 2020. These important gains would not have been realized without your leadership and dedication. For FY 2021, we respectfully ask that you consider continuing the continuing trend of investing in our forest resources, specifically through the Forest Services Forest and Rangeland Research, State and Private Forestry Programs, and the Bureau of Land Management Forestry Programs. Advancing forest science is integral to improving the health of U.S. forests and citizens, increasing the competitiveness of U.S. products in the global marketplace, and adapting to future challenges. Recent Forest Service research activities have developed innovative solutions to managing invasive species, improving smoke and fire management capabilities, and driving innovation and expansion of commercial applications for forest products. For FY 2020, we appreciate that this subcommittee not only rejected the drastic cuts to Forest Service research, but also championed an increase. For FY 2021, we urge you to increase funding for Forest Service research to no less than $310 million, which includes $83 million for Forest and Inventory Analysis Program and $227 million for the remaining research and development programs. As we all work to use resources more efficiently and effectively, state and private forestry programs provide a significant return on federal investment by leveraging the boots on the ground and financial resources of state agencies to deliver the land to landowners, communities, tribes, and other federal agencies. The President's budget for the last few years has proposed eliminating programs like urban and community forestry, 
and landscape scale res restoration. Again, we appreciate your efforts to continue these programs and secure much needed increases for the other five, pro the entire five programs of the state and private forestry uh, area. SEF recommends that these programs be funded at 20, FY 2020 levels and if possible, above. In addition, we urge you to consider increasing urban and community forestry to at least $35 million, forest health management on cooperative lands to $48 million. The Bureau of Land Management plays an integral role in improving the health and productivity of our nation's public lands. SAF asked this subcommittee to extend authorization for the Forest Ecosystem Health and Recovery Fund, which is currently set to expire this year. This fund specifically helps to support management that improves wildfire resilience and other benefits for BLM and adjacent lands. In conclusion, we understand and appreciate the resources are finite and that more money is not always the answer. However, our forests have, been long undervalued, have long been undervalued by society and underfunded by decision makers. Today, thanks to the growing and more sophisticated body of science, we know that forests and trees are a key to mitigating climate impacts and improving the health, well-being, and prosperity of our communities. Modest increases to the programs discussed today can yield incredible results for our forests. Please know that SAF and its diverse membership are always here as a resource to you. Whether you're looking for the latest science or insights from our on-the-ground practitioners, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you again for your leadership and your recognition of the importance of our forests, forest management, research, and forestry professionals. Thank you, uh, Chair McCollum, for having uh, me today, and uh, of course, uh, Ranking Member Joyce uh, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, Mr. Kilmer. Um, I'm Jonathan Asher. I'm the Director of Government Relations for Conservation Funding with the Wilderness Society. Um, and uh, uh, just want to start out by uh, saying, you know, in particular, thank you to you and your staff um, for uh, working across the aisle, but also, you know, in particular, um, taking advantage of the, the increased budget cap and negotiating the increased budget cap last year, and then also a full year bill. Uh, that's, uh, a, you know, a, a huge benefit, I think, to all of our priorities. So um, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I just want to share with you some priorities um, of the Wilderness Society. Uh, looking forward to this year um, and in doing a quick time of what I had written uh, it was like way over so I'm just gonna kind of go through what I can <laughs> there you go exactly <laughs> right uh, so uh, you know the, the the land water conservation fund remains um, one of the wilderness society's top priorities because of its uh, on the ground impacts and value to to actual conservation um, and to local communities uh, and to our natural landscape um, the increased funding level of 495 million last year uh, was greatly appreciated um, and, 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 and certainly acknowledged. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, as we look forward to this year, uh, noting that the, the program uh, remains authorized at, at 900 million, uh, we, you know, always continue to look for opportunities to increase that because of its uh, value to our local communities, uh, natural landscapes, recreation, um, and in particular climate change. Uh, LWCF is one of the main on-the-ground tools that we have uh, in addressing the impacts of climate change um, through, uh, through adaptation efforts, um, as, uh, as exemplified in the Sierra Nevada in California, where uh, the long history of kind of the patchwork of, of uh, railroad ownership uh, throughout the years has created kind of the, the, the pack patchwork ownership that makes it hard to uh, fight wildfires uh, efficiently. Um, the state uh, teamed up with, uh, with, uh, with the Forest Service localities, land trusts, and, and other landowners uh, to employ LDBCF to, to undo some of that patchwork. And it's actually seen a visible uh, increase in the ability to efficiently f address wildfires in the state. So they're using LWCF there as a, as a climate tool. Um, similarly, in New Jersey, um, uh, there was a large uh, wetlands project that was, uh, that was done um, uh, as a natural storm uh, buffer from hurricanes, uh, and, and in, in particular to, uh, to mitigate against the impacts of climate change. Um, a study by the insurance industry uh, showed that, uh, that similar efforts 
um, you saved upwards of you know several hundred million dollars uh, with Hurricane Harvey. So again, these natural solutions are really key to how we're looking towards the future of addressing uh, climate change, not only for our natural landscapes, but also for local communities in particular. So uh, the Land and Water Conservation Fund is critical to that effort, and uh, we certainly um, hope the committee will continue to uh, increase its funding levels and support that uh, critical program. Um, Additionally, we pay attention to renewable energy opportunities on public lands. Um, you know, while there is still authorizing legislation that is working its way through Congress, uh, we know that several uh, programs within your, uh, several line items within uh, the, the, the appropriations um, uh, bill speak specifically to renewable energy on public lands, and we, and we want to support those uh, and increase uh, responsible development of, uh, of, of renewable energy on public lands, again, as a, as a climate solution. Um, um, uh, the Wilderness Society is also pays particular attention to uh, wildlife refuges uh, and uh, noting in particular uh, funding for listing uh, under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, we certainly support that um, and, uh, and, and efforts to um, make sure that it doesn't get cut uh, this year. Um, uh, we'd like to uh, you know, continue to push for the um, uh, Legacy uh, Roads and Trails Program uh, to kind of be independent of the capital improvement and maintenance uh, um, fund. Um, and then uh, in particular also, you know, a number of oversight uh, provisions last year were great that we hope you'll continue to, put to uh, support this year, uh, including the Boundary Waters, including Chaco Canyon. Um, uh, and, uh, um, you know, and, and with the DOI reorg and the BLM uh, headquarters move, um, you know, these are uh, moves that the Trump administration has made um, that are, uh, you know, pretty um, uh, aggressive with respect to congressional authority, and we hope that you'll feel bolstered in your ability to continue those oversight uh, activities. Um, so with that, thank you again for, uh, for a lot of uh, a great bill last year. We really appreciate it and hope that you'll keep up the progress this year. Good afternoon, Madam Chair uh, and Ranking Member Joyce. Um, my name is Laura Ferrero, and I am a legislative representative for conservation and public lands with the League of Conservation Voters. Uh, as you know, uh, LCV is a national environmental nonprofit uh, focused on protecting our planet and everyone who inhabits it. Uh, and along with our 30 state affiliates uh, in the conservation voter movement, we work for a more just and equitable democracy where people and not polluters determine our future. Uh, so today, we want to thank you for the increased levels of funding in last year's interior appropriation budget. Uh, we're also very thankful uh, for the subcommittee's fiscal year 2020 bill, especially because it did not contain any long-standing anti-environmental provisions, and we urge you to take this approach once again. Um, our written testimony does detail a lot of our full budget recommendations, but today I would like to highlight just a couple of these programs. Um, so first, I would like to talk about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, uh, which in its 50 years of history, it has protected our public lands, increased accessibility to green spaces, and helped fuel our thriving outdoor recreation economy. Uh, what's more, uh, we want to talk about the uh, fact that LWCF also helps preserve our natural and cultural heritage. Uh, it helps uh, tell the stories of diverse communities in our country, and it supports green spaces in every single state and in in almost every county in the country. Uh, so we definitely appreciate uh, that Congress last year provided a sizable increase to LWCF and that the subcommittee provided even more uh, than uh, Congress did last year. Uh, so just to show how critical this program is across the country, I wanted to share the story of one of my colleagues, Barbara Hartzell. Um, Barbara was raised Nuwu, tribally she's a Chemehuevi Paiute from the Chemehuevi tribe of Lake Havasu, California and Las Vegas Indian Colony. Um, her grandmother was raised as an orphan and was forced into a residential school system that separated Indian children from their families, their culture and their heritage. Um, due to this, her grandmother lived her entire life with unanswered answer questions uh, about her family and Barb only got to know the story, the stories of this women through oral history and seeing their names listed in the Indian census rolls. Uh, the one vestige of the story that remains for her family is an old picture of her great-great-great-grandmother uh, at an unknown location. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, it was 
taken at the dollhouse at Kiel Ranch Historic Park in Las Vegas. Uh, and Barb, my colleague, came to this realization when she arrived at Kiel Ranch for an event. Um, one thing that we really want to highlight is the impact on her family. Uh, when she took her mother to the park, her mother's eyes filled with tears, her and her mother's words uh, still haunt her. Uh, her mother said, you mean they were real? You mean those people existed? Uh, Barb and her family were able to see the land their family lived on because of the Land and Water Conservation Fund and because of the money that pr it provided to the state of Nevada. Uh, so as my colleague puts it, uh, when we talk about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, we're talking about the importance of the preservation of our lands, our water, and more than anything, our heritage. Um, the League of Conservation Voters supports full funding of $900 million in discretionary appropriations for LWCF uh, in the fiscal year 2021. And we also look forward to working with Congress to find a permanent solution for LWCF. So as Barb put it, uh, we can focus on a new kind of conservation that centers on our voices, on our communities, uh, and instead of having to fight every year uh, for the special places. Um, in addition to that, I would now like to turn uh, to a different program, the National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, NEPA is one of our nation's bedrock environmental laws that fosters government transparency and accountability. Uh, for 50 years, it has enabled the public to provide critical input uh, on env the environmental effects that federal projects will have in our communities, public lands, wildlife, uh, habitats, as well as our health. Uh, but as you know, unfortunately, the administration has recently proposed uh, changes to NEPA. Uh, these changes would severely limit public input and undermine the analysis of cumulative effects. Um, more than anything, we want to highlight how guiding this process would have a dire uh, would have dire implications for mitigating climate change uh, and also to access to clean air, land, water, and especially for those in low wealth communities and communities of color, which are most often the most impacted by climate change and toxic pollution. Uh, because of that, we also wanted to share the story of one of our members, Jose R. Chapa, in, down in Texas, um, who has unfortunately been impacted uh, through toxic pollution. Uh, unfortunately, due to the time, I might not be able to tell the entirety of his story, but um, we definitely just want to uh, recommend that the committee uh, support funding prohibitions uh, on the Trump administration's plan to guide NEPA. So thank you so much. Our national forests is that they protect water, right? right. Big, uh, the Superior National Forest where this proposed copper Sulfide ore mine is, it's 20% of the National Forest water bank. Um, and I, I, uh, I appreciate the President's uh, initiative to plant a, uh, a million trees as we're losing trees to Asian ash borer, what's happening with, with the pine rust and the pine beetle and everything that's, 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 I could go on about gypsy moss. I could list a lot of little bugs that we don't want to have uh, f uh, flying around in our forests and embedding themselves in our trees. Um, but some of the things kind of going on with um, uh, extraction, whether it be of minerals and for national forest lands are impacted or um, uh, putting, in, putting in roads and in, in some of our uh, public land areas, um, is there much of a discussion? Are you having an, is there, we need to have a real education understanding about forests or more than trees are also about, about water. And I know when we have our uh, public-private forestry councils, those are the things that, you know, where we were sitting around the table, everybody learned from each other and it took some of the, the tension out of the room and some, some real opportunities to talk about what are our shared values, what should our goals be, um, you know, how do we make this work for for individuals? Maybe just tell me a little bit about some of the things that your organizations are doing to kind of hit it home that this is about protecting drinking water. And the forests also, when you replant, they need water too, so this water. So could you just maybe share a couple of things before we close up this panel on that? We're actually, we're, to, thank you. Um, 
we work not only in the national forest, but also uh, to help this public, private, and stewardship between states and national lands, and also working in urban areas to make sure that we have forests for everyone and tree canopy for everyone in urban areas as well. And every single one of those um, uh, projects and efforts all contribute to and have a nexus with drinking water. I, I came to American Forest from the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and there I was also working on forests because forested buffers are incredibly important to water quality in the Great Lakes and in, in, in Chesapeake Bay watershed. And this overlap is, is incredibly strong, and it's something that across USDA, it's very important to help all of those projects work together in order to, to maximize the, their ability to contribute to clean water. And uh, I don't know if that's helpful, but it's a, it's a broad perspective that from the mosaic of, of federal work and across uh, with, state, with state foresters and state lands, it's, a, it's complicated because there are so many, like with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, so many actors and ownership lands, but water is absolutely one of the top priorities that we have to focus on to get interest and buy-in and support for the forest work. That's a great question. Um, prior to coming to SAF, I spent almost 20 years with the U.S. Forest Service, so I'm very familiar with this particular question and some of the challenges that come with it. Um, I think overall, it's it's that that infamous challenge. It's it's about balance. It's about all the different parts and pieces that come into play, uh, and the players. And so that aspect of how do we look across boundaries? It's as you mentioned, it's not just about the national forest. It's about the state land. It's about the private landowner. Um, and it's also about the industrial landowner. And so when we look at all those lands married together, you know, where do we balance out the uses that we have to have? If it's a, if it's a mine, where is a place where it could be located where it has the least amount of impact? If it's actively for managing a forest, um, where can that happen in a way that, one, there's either rules or regulations to require reforestation um, to meet those needs to, to maintain that water quality over time um, versus not actively managing could put us in a place where we could have a catastrophic fire that would end up putting us in a much worse situation. And so it's, it's really this piece of, as you mentioned, those public-private um, discussions around, it's, in a lot of cases, many of these things do have to happen. So how do we, again, allocate those finite resources in a way where they're the least impactful and the most beneficial, both in the immediate time frame and long term? And so it really is all the folks around the table having a discussion and having to give a little bit to be successful. Um, and yeah, I would say, uh, you know, b being an appropriator from a, from a funding perspective, um, it's, f for us, it's valuable to look at, uh, you know, w what can we be doing to, to save costs and, and not just investing, you know, new money, but also ensuring that we're using the public resources uh, in the most responsible way. And so, um, again, with the Land and Water Conservation Fund, there's, you know, there are great examples of projects where, um, uh, we've conserved areas uh, for water supplies that have actually saved money over the long term. Instead of going out and building really expensive infrastructure, we're going out and conserving natural areas that help uh, to, to create, you know, clean water uh, opportunities in forests. Um, you know, I think if we're talking about uh, climate change and things like the Trillion Trees, you know, initiative uh, from for the Wilderness Society, we're also looking at, well, you know, let's be saving trees now too, right? So the Tongass National Forest and, and you know, in Alaska is a, is a place in the roadless rule um, are things that we're very active on right now, recognizing that in, in addition to building out the number of trees that we wanna have over the future, there's an important role to play in conserving places now. So that also comes through, uh, you know, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, but also the roadless rule. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and other kind of, uh, you know, I think, um, elegant solutions that your committee uh, put put forth last last year where conservation was in the interest of saving taxpayer resources like with the Arctic refuge I think that was a very uh, you know mindful way of addressing that and, and we hope that um, your committee and staff will will continue to find those uh, you know elegant policy solutions to to challenges that we face thank you Anything you want to add? No, I, I think Jonathan actually articulated so much of what I believe we, we're here for as well. So, thank you. Well, you guys were magnificent. What a great way to close out. Public lands, water, air, climate change, critters that we don't want to have invading our, our, our public <laughs> lands. Uh, you did a fabulous job. I can't thank you enough um, for, because uh, you're about a half an hour behind from what you thought your day was going to be but 
it, it meant the world to us that you were here uh, testifying. So with that, you get to uh, help me conclude this afternoon's hearing. And we will stand adjourned until our next uh, hearing, which is going to be Public Witness uh, Tribal Programs on February 11th, 2020. Thank you again. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.